Whoa, hello everybody! It's so great to be here after <laughs> this few years. Oh, miserable, yes. Okay. So, who, how are you doing? Okay. So, <laughs> you've just eaten lunch and now it's a really deep dive session. That sounds like we, some of you might uh, fall asleep. It happens, I know. It's like I was attending many times. It's like, uh, typically it's great to have some entertaining sessions after, after the lunch, but yeah, sorry. This will be a deep dive into, I don't know, it entertains me at least. Okay, so I will try to st stay in touch with you. And okay, who am I? Uh, like, uh, I'm Jarek and I started programming you know, in 1990, something with a Commodore 64. Still half of my brain is occupied by Commodore 64 memory map and assembly, and I can't get rid of that. Then I switched to Amiga, where I was mostly programming assembly, and then I switched to C, and then C++, and Java, and I spent like 15 years of my career mostly doing Java programming, regular Java programming. In the meantime, a little bit of you know this horrible JS or something. And uh, recently, I'm actually mostly Haskell developer, Haskell and Scala. But that's this is this talk is not about it. So a little there will be Scala because we have that in the topic. However, what's important? I am not some I don't know guy that's digging into uh, Oracle, JVM, changing stuff. No, I'm just a developer, and I'm mostly developing business application. Me. Even though I was officially uh, assigned as a performance manager, uh, engineer, uh, I'm basically doing just application development. And all that I'm going to present today is basically my normal experience when experiences when things were going wrong, or actually more often when I just wanted to know what's going on. And this is, let's say, the baseline. It's not for the people, the session is not for the people that want to, I don't know, become a part of Oracle JVM team or something like that. No, this is just for the people that want to know more what's happening and uh, want to sometimes, like actually this will be the main part of this, want to uh, know the tools if something goes wrong on the production. Okay, the reason why I'm interested in the topics of performance, uh, mostly because sometimes I got really angry. I still remember these times when I was hearing those statements. Who has heard, for instance, that Java is slow? Wow. Is Java slow? That depends. <laughs> but the point is, like, I've seen that the basic was slow. On Commodore 64, basic was slow. OK, I never had doubts about it. But there was a time in my life when C was considered slow. It was considered for this, you know, not really grown up developers that cannot write serious assembly. Really. And, uh, and if you were writing C, were you like not really that great developer? That was Amiga times. I really remember that. And I was writing mostly assembly, if it made sense or not, just to not be this guy, you know, writing in this horrible high level language. Okay, and then I switched to C++ and instantly I was hearing that, you know, C++ is obviously slow because it has objects, etc., etc. But it all, actually, all those statements come from some mm, reality, from some experiences, but they are basically too generic. Like, for instance, C is, C is Java slow. Like, the first versions of Java I was using in the 90s, they were slow. The hotspot was barely created, and before that, it was like mostly interpreted language. So, yeah, it was compared to C, it was slow, especially that the computers I was uh, we had had not enough memory to even keep JVM. So, yeah, if you are swapping, you are slow. But all those things are basically all those sentences are generic, and they, for instance, don't say which C version is slow, which C++ version is slow. This is which Java you are using, which JDK. 
This is all missing here on this picture. And what does it mean slow? What kind of program is slow? Yeah. So this is basically, um, these are statements that you can easily falsify. I just show one program where Java is, let's, let's say, uh, fast enough, uh, com let's say even sometimes faster than C++, and this is not true. So, but why we are so fascinated with low level and stuff like that, and why we want to make things uh, fast. Uh, fast right? uh, I remember mm, back then when I was writing assembly, this is actually my lovely Commodore 64 assembly, and there were some rules about this assembly, and I remember uh, exactly one thing from the assembly. This branch is equal. Who knows this assembly code? Oh, not that many people. That, that means uh, half of my presentation will be gone because I wanted to talk to you in assembly. Okay, don't worry. Not really. But basically, there is a basic instruction in assembly which means uh, jump if something. It's instruction that high-level language used to actually implement if. And this instruction means if something is equal uh, to zero, then jump to the end. And this is what, what you see on top is calculating Fibonacci numbers. Just trust me. But there was a small thing with this. Uh, that when you were do, uh, when we are not doing, not jumping, because basically from this instruction, either you go to the next line, and it takes two cycles on Commodore 64, or you jump to the end loop, and it takes three cycles. And I remember that this was like horrible. This is 50% slower. Uh, just avoid taking, taking branches. And I remember that people were deliberately rewriting code so that for instance, if you had this possibility to rewrite if statement, this branch, branch that, uh, for instance, mostly you do not jump, even if the code was horrible after that, you were choosing that because that was faster. Uh, should I say that mostly we were doing programs on Commodore 64 or Amiga that actually didn't need this performance, but nevertheless, we learned that because we like the simple rules how to dig in stuff. And actually, after all, I would say this is a simple rule. There's nothing you can, this is a little bit of a mind game how, uh, of uh, riddle, how to rewrite your code so that you don't, uh, 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 don't do branching, don't, don't take branches. But at the end, it's not that complicated. So you are happy after you, you, do, uh, you rewrite the code according to this rule. But then something happened. This guy. I still remember this moment. So I never actually had Amiga with this, with this processor, Motorola, uh, Motorola 68040. But I read the specification, and to my surprise, they changed the critical thing. So well, because on Motorola Basic, that was in my basic Amiga, there was the same rule about branching. But here, they decided actually after looking at code of applications that whatever we try, most of the branches are taken. So they introduced a rule that actually the, there is some kind of a prediction where the code will follow, and they made this processor perform that branch taken is actually faster than not taken. And all our codes, all our <laughs> misery we did for these years, like rewriting code to be more stupid, but you know, more performant, this now, made no sense for this processor because it actually was counterproductive. We actually made the code slower on a faster processor, so who would even see that? But nevertheless, that was something that was like, uh, first thing was I, I thought like Motorola is trolling us. And then I read basically all the CPU developers, Intel did the same, uh, and that was a common thing. And then that's how I learned this uh, stuff. Who knows this? Who said that, you know? Who wrote that? Knuf, yes, <laughs> Knuf. Okay, okay, at least that's how I know it. I might be wrong. So there will be here important lesson that I can be wrong about anything that I say, but I will show you how to check on your own, yeah? But basically, 
if we optimize, it must have some sense. So I tell you, all these things I was optimizing on Commodore or Amiga made no sense. And even later, I was op doing micro-optimizations. Rarely that had any sense. Like, that was just because it's, it gives me a pleasure. And sometimes, at the end, it was counterproductive. But there are more claims like about languages. So basically, there are like claims, you, I don't know, how you should deal with strings. And people, basically, I, I'm sure during this conference, some of you will hear some statements. Don't do this, do something else, because this is slower. This is typical performance myth, because what, what I learned during my life, those statements are typically not very precise. They are just too generic. Even if the, and sometimes, because sometimes they are valid, but only in a very specific case. And sometimes, and that's quite often, that's something that was true 10 years ago, like this branching. And, but the last is the most important. The most time, uh, the most parts of your code are actually doesn't matter how fast they are, because they are like called once or two times or even 10 times, but they are not in a critical loop. So if you make something three, two times slower, it doesn't really matter. But, but if your code is more clean after that, it's like, actually, that's a price, price you could pay. On the other hand, if you have like 90% of your code uh, ugly because you wanted it to be the most performant and you do a micro optimizations but this code is not really critical yeah that's how you'll end with a, a application that no one wants to touch uh, but you want it to be very performant so basically there is a cost of this performant myths and when we go to to the conferences like that, that we typically learn some of them some, sometimes we uh, bust them, let's say. We see, okay, that's not really true. We, we learned it, but sometimes we learn stuff that makes no sense. Uh, and at the end, we pay for that, and our, let's say, uh, who pays for that? Our customers. Because we put, uh, we make code actually sometimes even less performant, uh, but surely less beautiful. So this session is not about teaching you. So if you, after this session, learn something about you know particular java version or some construct in code that is faster or slower that was not my point my point was to bring you tools so that you can check on your own and you can check in late, one year later if the statement if the thing you've learned still makes sense yeah so okay so but the point is like we are really exposed uh, on this all performance thing because yeah, this sells well. Like, whenever I read about the framework, this is mostly what I see. Wow, it's so it's faster. I see some benchmarks, and you know there are like this lies, bigger lies, and benchmarks. Yeah, so benchmarks. It's easy to create benchmark that pr proves anything. That was a lesson I learned very early during my career. Like when my colleague, my colleague exactly was proving anything he wanted, just to yeah, just to for instance not write a clean code. Uh, but basically, mostly, and I, I just accept it. It's nothing we can do about it. But mostly people fall into this trap. Like there is a new framework, and everyone asks how fast is this. Rarely anyone asks, does it make my code better? Does it make my code easier to maintain? Okay. That's just the reality. And there is other problem. The other problem is that thinking that uh, we make, are making assumptions. When we see something in code, uh, we are making assumptions. And why we are making assumptions? Because you are all uh, Commodore 64 developers. Who, who was, who, who, uh, was uh, doing programs for Commodore 64? OK, not that many of you, but I think most of you have some mm, notion how the, how the stuff works, how the hardware works, have some idea. And these ideas are mostly uh, assuming uh, that this is a simple machine that takes an instruction, processes this instruction, writes something in memory. That's how PDP-11 in the 70s worked. 
because that's that's how we learn during when we study at university how how, how assembly code how machines work those are very simple models the problem is that in reality that's uh, that what we have is not that simple sometimes so here is a little bit of assembly code i just wanted to present that there are some instructions and our thinking about it there is like instruction process some it has some arguments then so it reads something from memory store, stores in a register and the next line next line and that's how the uh, stuff works but unfortunately it's uh, how we can the model is correct when when we look at this program, we analyze it one by line, what it did. This model of thinking is just, is just serial. One instruction, next instruction, and, and again and again, is okay. But that's not how the CPU works. That's how not, not how the modern mm, software is working. And now, example. Okay. So, uh, example. I hope we have enough time to try something uh, uh, on a for real, because you know I hate when uh, I have to prove. So first, look at the code, and then we'll try uh, to run it with, from IntelliJ. So there is this crazy data structure. Who already has idea what I'll be presenting? So uh, can you tell? Yeah, so already some, some of you know what I'm presenting, and they are actually right. So uh, those cash miss, but okay. Uh, for those that uh, not everyone knows, great, I will show you something about the modern architecture that might not be true in five years, who knows. But it's true for this computer. So we have this data structure, and we have some uh, counters. And by the way, who knows what volatile is? Okay, so I, this is not a session about Java concurrency, so I will not explain how vol, uh, Volatile works, but basically it means this, is, this will be shared between threads. And this is kind of like atomic uh, uh, vari variable, atomic field, that multiple threads can change. So we have counter one and counter two, and then we have counter three, and then we have three methods to increment, okay? And now what we'll do, this is some kind of method. I called it M1 because naming is hard. M1 is a great name for whatever method. Just uh, you will see a lot of that. Uh, so what we do, basically, we create this data. This is the uh, first uh, line. And then we have two threads, two separate threads. Each of them is incrementing the counter. By the way, I, for some reason, I don't see. Ah, there is a comment crime. Incrementing volatile like this is a crime. But I just wanted to present something. It's not how you, how you code. But there is this, uh, so we have two threads. Each of them separately increments a counter. What can go wrong? So in this particular code, it actually works. And then I just run it for some time. And yeah, and that's it. I will just return uh, the shared data at the end of this method. And then I have Method M2, that's also a great name for a method, because that's the second important method here. So this has only small change that I'm incrementing counter 1 and then counter 3, not 2. And basically, those two pieces of code, method 1 and method 2, they not, do not work together. I just run method 1 for some time, which starts these two threads and those two incrementation in those threads, and then method, th uh, method 2, which does the same, uh, but with counter one and counter three. Uh, going back to uh, to data, yeah, this looked like that. Okay, so maybe it's time to actually run it. Okay, oh, now something. We'll measure time. Uh, this is very professional benchmark. I will refer to that later. We have some. Uh, uh, we measure current time in milliseconds. Then we run M1. Uh, then we measure M2, and we do the, that in a loop, and we sum the times so that more or less we see the results at the end. Yeah. Okay. Uh, before I go to the results, let me just switch to the code. Ah, not here. 
So there is somewhere this code here. And do I have a main method? Ah, just. Uh, so, okay, I don't see it here. Oh, maybe that's it. I'm running that. I have no idea what happens because, yeah, if something goes wrong, that would be actually great because it will yeah, be interesting. So let me make this bigger. Okay, it takes a little bit of time. Hopefully, I didn't do it too. Ooh, I did it a little bit too, too long. So just, you know what? I will make it shorter. So sorry. Uh, first of all, uh, tip, tip. that's how you, when you pre uh, change something before presentation, it happens. So well, hopefully, it still will work correctly. Now we should see something after seconds. Okay, it goes, it goes, and I see it produces the results I expected. So that the second, second call, second M2 method, which was increasing counter one and counter three, is way faster. So there will be explanation for that, but we, we can do something crazy. For instance, if I move this counter like here, or maybe here, what will happen? If it doesn't happen what I am expecting, I will have a tough time here. And sometimes, you know, it was not once when I actually had it. <laughs> well, it's actually, oh, it's, it's uh, oh, one thing, it's very random. So proving something with this randomness is not a great idea. That's why I increased this to 50 uh, millions. I will refer to that. Huh? But basically, this is, this is a really bad benchmark. But it shows something. I just moved it, and I had different results. Actually, right now, they are relatively similar. And the point, if we had more time, if we invested more time into this, we would have uh, more or less M1 equal M2 when it comes to times. So this is, let's say, performed on another machine with different uh, settings, but this is the result. Uh, OK, some lessons initially. Never ever, like, if you're measuring time, doing like current time millis. You write it and you already failed. Who, who is measuring time like that? Raise your hands. I want to know who failed. You, you, and you. Okay. <laughs> okay. There are ways to make it's It's like not always this is wrong, but quite often I've seen this code in production. I put myself this time of. Uh, the, these types of uh, measurements on production, and it mostly leads to some mm, false results. Let's say it's, it's very pr uh, prone to some errors. Uh, and obviously, incrementing volatile was basically wrong. It was working in this scenario. But the point is we were looking, uh, wanted, uh, I wanted to, to present is false sharing. Uh, and what is false sharing? It's because. Uh, is an effect. Now in a Java program, we see how CPU internals are like uh, done. So this is some picture. Like I couldn't find a lot of pictures that were done and are actually with Creative Commons license. So I have crappy pictures most, mostly. But I am afraid to use uh, some you know uh, pictures that someone worked and are like uh, proprietary. But if we have multiple cores. On a some, this is some CPU. Then we have caches. Why do we have caches in CPU? Yeah, speed, speed, speed. But the, the reason is because memory is slow. Memory is slow, like uh, uh, disk drive uh, was slow in the past. Now memory is slow. This is the main bottleneck in the performance for, of the CPU for many years. And how to deal with that? We actually, producers of, uh, producers of CPUs started to use caches. And cache is basically a memory, but that is very close to um, processor, that is uh, faster, but 
you can't use uh, that much of this memory. So we have levels of cache, and the most important level of cache basically on any architecture is L1. What is L1? This is the actual cache that processor is working on. So this is the if we have this cores, you will see that uh, on top of each core, there is something called L1D. It is L1 cache for data. And there is also L1I, which is L1 cache for instructions. The cache for instructions is not that important uh, for this presentation. Basically, that's a relatively easy topic. But cache for data is interesting. And there is not much of this cache. Here, here it's like 16 kilobytes for each core. And uh, OK, I will uh, tell later how it works. But uh, what is important here is that uh, this is the, the only level of cache that actually CPU can work on. If something uh, is not in the cache, it's basically not there for the CPU. So uh, yeah, that, that's it. And however, this is a small amount of memory, small amount of cache. So typically, and it costs a lot to create it because it must be very fast, very close to the, let's say, processing unit of uh, arithmetic unit of the CPU. So there are also L2 caches, which are bigger, like here, two megabytes, a little bit farther from the, uh, from the, from the core of, of CPU, from the processing core. And then there is a L3 cache, which typically uh, has a, a property that it's, not, uh, that it's not tied to one core. It is common, it is shared between cores. It doesn't really matter that much, because the most important, as I said, is L1. And when something is not in L1 cache, then the processor checks maybe it's in L2. If it's in L2, then it's got transferred to L1, and then the processor can use that. If something is not in L2, maybe it's in L3. And now comes the problem, what if uh, there is the same data um, shared between the same piece of RAM shared between different cores? Uh, I will refer to that briefly. Yeah. Because I'm not a CPU specialist, so what I'm presenting here is only like explanation what just has happened. So we just remember that everything must be in L1, but that doesn't really explain the thing we've seen. Uh, but that actually explains. So cache lines. Because it's not that cache is like a hash map, oh, here is this memory in RAM, uh, this, this byte in RAM, and I have it here in, in, in cache. That would be very inefficient. Cache is organized in so-called cache lines, so basically blocks of memory. So each block of memory can be either fully in L1 or basically can stay in memory in L2. And this block typically on a modern architecture is 64 bytes long. Actually, I think it would be now hard to change this number to something else, because tons of codes actually rely that it's exactly 64 bytes for performance. But nevertheless, what it means, even if you want to access like a specific cell in memory, one byte, it will be transferred with all 64 bytes around. This is cool, yeah? So always, this is like the smallest chunk of memory that your processor can actually read from RAM. This is like uh, between RAM and uh, on the bus, between RAM and CPU, the memory goes in the 64 bytes chunks. And then cache line L1, uh, in L1 we have these cache lines, uh, for instance, we have cache line zero, which maps to some block in memory. Uh, the same with uh, L2 and, and so on. And now the point, what we've seen was a structure that was actually a little bit longer than this 64 bytes. So this counter tree was after this 64 bytes. And when we had two threads working, and if they were referring to the piece that was in the same cache line, like counter one and counter two, what was happening, two cores basically had to exchange constantly one cache line, like constantly were marking, this is no, this is, I changed that, you cannot use that anymore. So it has to be written to memory or to L2, and then other processor cannot use his copy of the same cache line. It knows, oh, actually, it's invalid. I have to read it. So basically, that was constantly, this cache line was constantly kind of jumping between two cores, between L1 and two cores. Or, yeah, that's uh, if those threads by luck were like on one core, maybe in hyper-threading or something, if you had one core CPU without hyper-threading, 
that problem wouldn't be actually occurring. But yeah, we have multi cores and we pay for that. So if I deliberately put my counter tree after this 64 bytes, because I pad it, let's say, with, with, uh, uh, with longs, each of them is eight byte long, then I had actually I used for a second thread different cache line. And now basically both threads could work without any conflicts on two different uh, cache lines and there was nothing to synchronize. Interesting, honestly, in real life, uh, this false sharing happens sometimes and there is even a special annotation you can use to in introduce padding in your data structure. But I wanted you to know that that is uh, that, that there is some such thing, but it's not that it's really critical to know about it. It's just interesting. Uh, and if you want to know more, there is something called messy. Basically, those are states of cache, uh, cache lines, uh, uh, messy protocol. But again, if you are working with real life applications and deal with databases, rarely you will actually encounter this problem. If you do some heavy, I don't know, machine learning or stuff like that, especially multi-threaded, it might be a physics simulation, etc. that you will encounter this problem. And yeah, then have luck, because tracing that is not that easy, but I will show you a little bit how. So we have another example. Now this is quiz who, who actually is Java certified developer, Oracle certified developer. Great. You are the only guys in this room that probably can answer this. I, so we have method calc1. What is this? This is two-dimensional array. And two-dimensional array is something we only learn for the exam and never use anymore. Yeah? Obviously. Like, so, so we have method calc1 when we loop this array and basically sum something. And then we have method uh, greatly na named again, calc2, and we also loop. You see the difference between those two? It's what is first, what is second, it, ij or ji. Now, guess which is faster. Which is faster on, for instance, on this exact PC? Calc 2. Oh, you guessed wrong. <laughs> okay, uh, but there will be a... So it's how many nanoseconds per, per, like, uh, per loop, and calc 2 is visibly, significantly slower. Why? Yeah. Yeah, when we, when we read array, Row by row, normally it's, let's say, in, it's in memory, also row by row, so we basically read one by one. And not, o not only we have like consistent cache line one, and then we read a couple of things from cache line one, then cache line two, blah, blah, etc. It's only that, it's also that P processor can prefetch the next cache line. It sees, oh, now I'm summing something in this one, and very likely, I will be asking for a next cache line, next 64 bytes, in a moment. So as long I'm, as I'm going, let's say, more or less consistently with the memory layout of this structure, it's all OK. But if I start to do column-wise, then it means I'm taking a cache line from one, let's say, subarray. Then I am jumping much forward and taking cache line, which is, I don't know, uh, 1,000 bytes farther and then 1,000 bytes farther, and then again I'm going back to the original cache line uh, that I started from, but the problem is probably it's already evicted from cache. So it's not performant, and the only problem is that, honestly, I never know which layout is correct when I looked at this two-dimensional array. And so, yeah, it, you have to be prepared for the exam to actually know that, but okay. So we've seen, a, again, the same thing uh, about Cache, cache lines, cache organization, and how it affects uh, our code. Uh, here even more, we can actually, who has heard about these things? What's this? So those are performance counters, because like, if you analyze a piece of code that you have no idea about, you haven't yet analyzed, you, know, and you may ask, 
PC, uh, CPU to actually give you some counters, some metrics about the code. For instance, how many instructions are were there? It's uh, how many cycles you spent on this piece of code. And uh, specifically, you, you can also ask how many cache misses I had. So calc1, you look at this column. I will show it with mouse. Look at this column here. Data cache load misses. 6% of all hits is miss. So it means so many times processor asked for something that was not yet in cache and had to wait before it was loaded. And in the calc2 version, you see that one. And there are, for instance, things that I do not fully understand here on this picture, like branch misses. Why I also have branch misses together with that? Uh, okay, not, yeah, this is like significantly different uh, number, also small one, but yeah, so it's not that looking at this picture I understand everything. But let's say more or less it confirmed what I learned from other conferences that the point here is cache misses. Yeah? And I will show you how to get these things on a, on a PC, because I, that's the point. But uh, who has seen this picture? Great. So you've been to many conferences. This is a picture like, uh, who has been to a Java conference and hasn't seen this picture? Okay, some of you. So it's like whenever we talk about performance, reactive something, this picture comes, and uh, I'm not sure, maybe the original author was uh, uh, Bonnier, uh, Mr. Bonnier, I'm not sure, but uh, surely he make it popular. But basically, it is to visualize what are the time differences between uh, uh, doing stuff in cache and, for instance, from main memory. So if we look at this corner here, one nanosecond, this red uh, square, uh, black square is one nanosecond. So if we refer to the byte from L1 cache, actually to the to the to the uh, word, so that would be word is now eight bytes, uh, so long basically. Uh, it can take like half of nanoseconds. By the way, these are numbers. Numbers are not that important, and they were actually taken like five years ago. But what is important is uh, and the differences. So this is what if something is not in L1, but in L2. We have to wait a little bit, and this is already like yeah more than ten times slower. And this whole represents 100 nanoseconds. And this is exactly with a blue. It's when something wasn't in any cache, was in the main memory. So it's 200 times slower. And actually, this is more or less consistent with what you read, that if you miss cache, like mean, I want to read something from cache in this line. I like, there is something not, not, uh, not in the cache yet, has to be taken from, a, from memory. Processor is waiting. Uh, waiting till it's loaded, and it can take time as long as executing 100 to 200 instructions. So that's what I read. It's actually not that easy to measure, but uh, it depends on the case, but it's really 100. So if you have, let's pretend it's 100. So if you have like four gigahertz, uh, four gigahertz CPU that is constantly missing cache, how fast is that? 100 times slower, so it's 50 megahertz, am I right? Think for a moment that you're, if you are not, let's say, friendly, your, your algorithm that you've written is not really friendly to memory, it's not really friendly to caches, it's working like 50 megahertz CPU. Oh, that's, that's a thing. Okay. Uh, let's... So, to summarize, again, I am not really... Uh, specialist on CPU, all of that is mostly that I learned check on my own. I have no idea about many things that are happening inside, but modern CPUs have, have caches, have pipelining. It means that when we, it's not that it takes one instruction after another. Constantly there are like 10 instructions executed at once. One is just analyzed, second is uh, after analysis is like decompiled a little bit, there is some microcode, and again and again. So it basically looks like more, not like one by one, I, like if there was like a factory worker, uh, it's not taking one, if a PC, uh, CPU was a factory worker, it's not that it takes an instruction and does all the things. This is like a, a belt when there are like 10 people, each of them does one small thing and passes to another, and constantly you have in a pipeline like 10 instructions or something. So at the end, even, oh, 
sorry, what just has happened? Uh, moved my, just a moment, skip to the CPU. Even if a single instruction on CPU takes, uh, I don't know, 10 cycles, because you are executing 10 of them at once, it can be that you are actually achieving speed like one instruction per second. So, so actually in, the, uh, in this numbers before, it was also visible. Then there is this branch prediction. So in the past, there was a very simple branch prediction like constant, like in 90s, that branch is always taken. Now it's actually the code, the um, CPUs are smart enough to, for instance, check how many times this branch was taken and predict, oh, if it was taken 10 times, probably 11th time also will be, or vice versa. Like uh, it wasn't taken constantly, then it won't be probably next time. There is some uh, speculation. Even more, like sometimes uh, in this pipeline, processor finds out, oh, this instruction that I am working now actually doesn't depend on the previous instruction results. So I can execute it now. I don't have to, because the other one maybe is referring to some memory somewhere else. It's slow. And this one is basically having all of that. So it means when you read the code of assembly, you can think of it that it's executed one by one. But in practice, that might not be a case. And sometimes the, uh, so it never changes the actual result of the computation, but it changes the performance. Also, register renaming and all that stuff. So register renaming is basically if you are not a smart developer and you are constantly like using three registers and just neglecting all the others, CPU will be, will be actually smart enough to, for instance, uh, 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 change somehow in your code. Let's think like change and use all the others because it says, oh, it doesn't make sense that you are constantly like working on R1, R2 registers and uh, or basically uh, because I see that some data is independent, doesn't have to, uh, to wait for R1, I can do it on R3. Yeah, so this is like, uh, like uh, so registers like, uh, like variables, but you have only like, I don't know, 30 of them. So if you try to use only two, Sometimes your code will not be very fast, but yeah, CPU will can, can make it faster. Uh, so in a uh, in a cycle, there can be mo multiple instructions uh, made. But one thing is that uh, this is only I wanted only to introduce CPU. How that it makes our measurements sometimes crazy because we look at the code. Code is more or less the same. Should we perform the same way? But it's not because of that. But we have even bigger problem. We have Java or Scala. Actually, this was uh, I am mostly Scala developer, but it doesn't really matter. There will not be any tough Scala programs today, so don't worry. But if we have a Scala code, then it's compiled to the bytecode. So bytecode, everyone reads here bytecode. Who can read bytecode? Oh. <laughs> So honestly, I don't read bytecode. So I, I understand what's there, but I cannot read it fluently. It's a horrible language. It's an interesting language, but it's not something you are supposed to write. But uh, if we have a compiler, it translates to bytecode. Uh, what is uh, here important is not some people think, OK, Scala is compiled to, compiled to Java, or Kotlin is compiled to Java. This is not true. Why? Sorry? JVM bytecode, but why cannot we say it's compiled to Java? Yeah, so basically, sometimes after this compilation, so quite often you can decompile this bytecode and get Java equivalent of this code. But quite often, uh, in both cases, in Kotlin or, or Scala, you will get the bytecode that no real Java can produce. So doesn't exist a Java code that produces this bytecode. So that basically means, yeah, it is something different. It's Scala, it's not like transpiled to Java. It's compiled to bytecode. Yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, probably there should be a pri huge prize for someone that uh, describes what is the real difference between transpiler and compiler. But OK, this is the other topic. But then we have a JVM with garbage collector and a lot of stuff that will be in the next part that works on this bytecode, and then we interpret it. Interpreting means we are doing actual, let's say, assembly, but one by one, slowly. And then we have a compiler, uh, 
So those are very ancient names, C1, C2. Uh, basically, who can, ex uh, who can explain what is C1 and C2? Okay? So, yeah, that, that's a great answer. So basically, when we compile, so the JVM compiles code on the fly. But in the past, we actually could choose. Should it be relatively not aggressive? Should it work just fast and compile it fast, uh, good enough for the performance? Or should it actually be very aggressive with this optimization? But then the compilation will be slower, which means, for instance, that the whole JVM, whole, whole the application will start very slowly because yeah, every time a method is um, analyzed that it has to be compiled, it will slow down for the relatively more complex uh, optimization. So before we had this client and server uh, attributes for a JVM in the past. Now it's more smart. It's basically when, when a hotspot, when JD, JVM sees, oh, this method should be, uh, should be compiled, then it's first compiled with, let's say, level one compiler, which is relatively fast, not, uh, not, doesn't produce that optimal code, but it's still much better than interpreted. And then when this method is actually hot, then it goes to C2. So it takes more time, it's more aggressive in optimization. So do you know what, when actually, what causes the decision to be, uh, for, for the method to be compiled? how Hotspot knows when to compile something. Yeah, this is basically, OK, I haven't checked before that presentation, but for many years that was true. Actually, maybe if we have time, we can check it. But basically, there was a simple counter. If it's executed, guess uh, who knows how many times was like accepted number, like a default for a first level compilation for C1? No. So it was 1,500, so 1,500. That was like a default number for C1. And 10,000, uh, that was given here, is basically for a second for a C2 compiler. So if the method was uh, invoked uh, 10,000 times, it means, oh, it is really, really used. And by the way, those are not only methods, sometimes uh, like uh, while loops, etc. But in the past, for instance, that was funny. I remember like in the days of Java 1.3, Sometimes, when you split your code into multiple methods, it was faster. Because if you were, if you were keeping things in one method, then actually this one method was only invoked, you know, I don't know, two times. Maybe you had everything in the main. And then it was always interpreted. But this was like fixed. Now, it like basically, if you are branching, like have while loops, etc., those can be like also treated like methods and have invocation counts. At least last time I checked. I haven't checked just before this presentation on, on a hotspot. So maybe it has changed. But I don't see a reason for that. OK. So and then this assembly goes to CPU, which is uh, already a complex thing. Yeah, and yeah. So when we analyze, and then all that works on operating system that, for instance, may for some time stop your code, because it decides that now we, I don't know, proceed with graphics because there is like some, some driver for graphics, or we just run another program. So measuring, especially if you use system current time in millis, what you can measure, like some effect on CPU oh, because, I don't know, something wasn't yet in cache and now, but later it will be. Or something in the OS because yeah, OS decided you know, your code, uh, your process is uh, uh, not as important as some other process. Or maybe you measured how much time it took to compile with a C2. So it is a problem if you measure with current time in milliseconds. But OK, we can deal with that a little bit. But just uh, it's the first moment when we will maybe take a short break uh, for some questions, because we'll go deeper. And yeah. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay, so here is a story that uh, uh, 
just to, if you haven't heard, that there was a code that was starting some method, that was invoking some method 10,000 times at the start of the program. And actually, I've seen this technique. Uh, it's basically to, ma uh, to make code run faster. But okay, uh, this is, does it make sense? If, for instance, you, uh, I can understand when it makes sense. So for instance, you, have, you are behind a load balancer. So there is a load balancer. It means HTTP requests go to, to, to application. But there are, for instance, you have two nodes. Like this is one my one JVM, this is second. And now I restart one of those. And then what I do? In a load balancer, I disable the re request don't go to the one JVM. Only are served by the second. And the problem, maybe this is a very critical application that has to respond very fast. So we don't want that the request takes two seconds, maybe because there will be even timeout. It must be served fast. So what we can do is basically we start this application, then we artificially warm up it. Actually, the other way would be to actually call the service, like uh, within, with a bash script or something, just to make it hot. So when we finally, we deployed a new version, we start it, now it's everything interpreted, but we make it hot artificially. So we make, uh, I would say, the best way would be actually to call real services. And then when it's finally like, responding in one second, we actually enable it on the balancer. So done, a request from, I don't know, other customer comes, and it's served fast. So this technique is not that stupid. So I would, uh, I would say uh, when I've seen it, mostly it was uh, uh, not really used uh, uh, for a real reason, well, mostly for fun. But I can understand that there will be a real reason behind this. OK. Uh, there are people that will know way more about, and for instance, I'm referring to this talk. It was also presented at DevOx, yeah. Uh, some other question? OK. I don't remember this either. So we can, I will show you how to learn which methods were compiled. But the hints not. What we can do, we can, and uh, it's something I haven't prepared, but we can check. Those numbers, it's called compilation threshold. We can change it. So in the past, when I was just, you know, changing from C++ developer that everything was compiled to Java, that was one of the first things I changed. I decided, oh, I cannot understand why it has to uh, invoke method one uh, 1,500 times. Compile it immediately. So I changed it to 10. Oh. Then it means all the methods on the JVM were compiled after 10 invocation. Guess what happened? Not only slow startup, the application was horribly slow. <laughs> horribly. It was like, what even happened? And then I was experimenting, and I realized actually this 1,500 is quite a good number. Uh, the same with uh, the server compilation. So basically, not only your application starts slower. It is actually slower. It is incredible, but uh, who can explain that, maybe? OK? OK, this is a, so the explanation, we are compiling methods that are not useful. And where, what happens? This is code that is stored somewhere in memory. So it occupies memory. So it actually makes your Java uh, heap s smaller. And maybe it, because of that, you will even go to swapping or something like that. That is one of the things that basically all the Java processes run faster, more or less. OK, this is something I shouldn't have said. But mostly, mostly, if you give more RAM to Java process, it will perform better. Yeah, if you don't do, unless you give too much RAM. But if now a lot of this RAM is occupied by compiled methods, unnecessary because, for instance, there are hundreds of methods that are only needed during the JVM startup, and then never more. And though if they are compiled, they only occupy space. So you have less for your program. But there is a second thing. So basically, when your method is interpreted, not only there is a statistic how many times it was called, there are some ifs inside, so branches. So Hotspot will basically see how many times you actually jumped in if, so you really did if, or how many times you did else. 
And this is a statistic on your code that is dynamically calculated. And then, when this code is really compiled, especially with C2, you can use this statistics. Oh, I know that this code, this, this if actually mostly uh, goes to else, then even actually what can even happen that only uh, if it never went to the true, this part of a true clause or, uh, of if condition will never not be even compiled, will one won't be there. Yeah, I, don't, I don't show this case, but maybe we can try it if we have time. But it means that, for instance, then your code of method is smaller and what can happen? It is small enough to be, for instance, inlined. But if you don't have the statistics, or if they are wrong because during the startup they are not really fully collected, then you are actually optimizing code for something that was not really statistically yet well covered. Okay, this is something you can play with. Actually, I loved displaying with compile threshold in the past. Oh, now, now, after I realized, okay, I cannot be better than engineers at Oracle, I gave up. Ah, oh, there is a, I, I only remember one thing, which actually was useful in production. You can say that some methods will never be compiled. So there is a way to say, please never try to compile this method. And there are two reasons for that. One is uh, because, uh, because if it compiles, it actually crashes. So it happened to me a few times when I was using uh, proprietary components that were obfuscated. So you have obfuscated code, and for instance, new JVM version, I, I load a new JVM version on server, and now this library, we actually paid a lot of, for this, crashes every time it tries to be compiled. So we note, okay, please do not compile it, because there is a strange code that uh, Java JVM doesn't understand, the particle version of JVM. Second is uh, there are some cases when there happens a loop. Mm, it means that the method is compiled, and then it's decompiled, and then compiled again, and decompiled, and compiled again, and decompiled. Uh, this is something called uncommon trap. I haven't prepared an example for that. Maybe we'll see accidentally somewhere. But basically, if something like that happens, maybe it's better, okay, better to uh, uh, try to understand what has happened, but other way would be, let's give up on compiling that. And actually, you would make your system faster but not compiled, by not compiling. Okay, in the next part, I will now go to the JVM a little bit more, how you can analyze what's happening in the JVM. Then we'll go to some diagnostic tools for the JVM and measuring performance. And at the end, like when the times go out, i actually show you some assembly. Okay. Okay, so let's go to the JVM. So this is my crappy picture about JVM. What's there? Actually, there are more things, so just-in-time compilation, garbage collection, a lot of stuff. Yeah, a lot of stuff that affects how your program is performing. Uh, because, and would be great to be able to see into what's happening, yeah? Okay, just a moment. Because we sometimes want to optimize our things. And by the way, what we can optimize? Faster starts. Who has a problem that on the production, Java starts too slow and wants to make it faster? OK, you have this problem. So what, what are the solutions there? OK. So did you use Graal native? And, it's fast, uh, and it starts faster, and it does the job. OK, so this, one of the things you can use is to use a native ahead of time compilation and then uh, pre-compile basically your stuff. Uh, it's, I won't show it today, and this thing works, but there is a cost for that. Basically, this code will be generally way slower than dynamically compiled on a long run. So you have to decide, does it actually Makes sense. I am in a situation that I want a fast start or I actually want a fast processing later. And Java, basically, I would say mostly we give up on the fast starts. So there is a way, but basically, if you want fast start, and that's the most important thing you are optimizing, maybe the Java wasn't a good choice at all. <laughs> okay. Some, okay, if it's good enough, then it's good enough. But I would say sometimes people are, for instance, running things on Docker 
they can they try to run native compilation, which uh, sometimes this is a problem. You have some heavy reflection-based um, frameworks, but still it's doable. But at the end, it's still it starts faster, but still not as fast as, for instance, program written in a, yeah, you know, a native language. Yeah, whatever, like C++. I don't recommend, but maybe Rust or something else. So latency. So we want. Uh, it means that. Our goal is when it comes request, we want to serve it as fast as possible. Java is actually okayish in that. And this is the thing we sometimes do. And okayish, it means maybe it's not the best language for that. Because what, we have, uh, what kind of problem we face with Java when our goal is to, uh, to limit latency? We want to serve things as fast as possible. So. Yes, garbage collection is a pig. Oh. So, and for instance, I faced it while doing, okay, now crazy stuff, 3D game in Java. So Java is fast enough to serve, to process 3D scenes and everything. But if you then do a game that every couple of seconds just freezes for like 100 milliseconds, it's already bad enough to destroy user experience. Obviously, I was doing that uh, more like 15 years ago when we hadn't, didn't have that good garbage collector uh, that as we have now. But this is still a small problem. A garbage collector, and there are areas when basically, when, uh, in order to make a really good latency, uh, you have to write like C. Like, so your Java looks like C. And now comes the point, so what was the point of using Java at all? Like, when you write exactly bad code. Okay, there is a point, but I would say Java is okay-ish in that, but not great. Whereas Java great is the next point, true output. We want to process as much data, data as possible. So this is exactly the, process, the moment we, we have this problem, like performance really true output, when Java shines, basically because all this dynamic uh, compilations that analyze what's actually happening, which might depend on the data that we are using, that's where it actually pays off. Like, that's where you actually see, oh, Java can be actually faster than, I don't know, uh, uh, written C++, etc. And last thing, when I would say is a pain point for Java is a use, usage of memory. Who had a problem that Java was consuming too much memory? Oh, all of you. And who had a problem that was actually, no matter what you did, it was still too much because the server had some limitations, yeah? This is the place where sometimes, because who had a memory leak in Java? Who is surprised that you can have memory leaks in Java? Okay, great, none of you. But I remember the moments when people were surprised that we can have memory leaks in Java. Oh, you have garbage collector, how can, how can you even have a leak? Oh, Obviously, we can have with a garbage collector. It's actually even easier to have a memory leak than without, because what garbage collector is preventing you mostly is for using unallocated memory, for memory that was freed and all that errors. But actually, in C++, for instance, if you if you make a mistake in memory management, like manual, you get a crash. You have some access uh, access violation exception, something like that. I still remember those days. And then it means like you have to immediately fix the problem. In Java, basically, you never see that. You, you see a null pointer exception. But if you, for instance, uh, if you, you don't have a notion like deallocate this object, you, because it's basically as long there as you refer to that. And sometimes, yeah, those leak because you don't even see where the objects are referred, maybe in some static map or whatever. So uh, mostly when I'm thinking about performance on Java, I'm concentrating on true output and a little bit on latency, but all the other things I consider not really, if, if I am having this problem, then I think maybe Java wasn't the greatest choice for this particular problem. Uh, one more thing, when I'm talking JVM, which JVM I'm talking about? Okay, so this is a very generic talk. I will show you some differences between two particular versions of JVMs. But basically, we have a couple of vendors, but I'm mostly concentrated on this open JDK, but how uh, based, but how can we actually manage that? Who has multiple Java version on his PC? How do you manage that? 
Sorry? Yes. So for first tool that you should start with, who, who doesn't use SDK man? Who haven't heard about it even? Like, so really, please, like if you have, oh, okay, uh, I think SDK man doesn't work well on a Windows, but if you have Linux machine, whatever, and you want to experiment, or actually you need to use different JVM versions, SDK man is your place to go. It makes, especially if you are like wondering what was fixed in the new version, what is the difference between different versions of JVM, or you basically have different software, like this application works in Java 6, yeah, because I'm lucky, or then this works in Java 17, because, yeah, bad luck, or whatever. And then you basically install different versions, and you can switch easily to another installed version, and you have constantly created list of uh, available uh, uh, um, available Java versions. By the way, SDK Man also handles things like Maven version, SBT version, whatever tool you use, basically this uh, all around JVM, uh, it has uh, some versioning for them, command line tools. And it takes care about uh, Java Home and stuff like that. Now, if you do it, try to do it manually, it is a pain. Okay, so now let's jump to some example. So cases when Something is interesting on the JVM, and we'll observe that. So, general question, what is faster, static method call or virtual method call? Static, everyone knows that static is faster. Now we'll see how much faster. Oh, so, okay, a little bit of complex code because I don't know. So, uh, there is a quadratic equation on top, and we'll try to solve it. So basically, we have some array of coefficients, like, uh, and will be for all, all those coefficients, it's a long array, uh, we'll be calculating the roots. So you know this, this equation, that there is some delta, uh, b squared minus 4 times a times c. If it's uh, bigger than 0 uh, or 0, then, OK, sometimes if it's exactly 0, we'll have one root, but you know, checking for 0 with W is already a problem, so I didn't want to get into that. I made it this way. Always return an array of two uh, roots. Maybe they are actually the same, but I don't care. But if the delta is, uh, is negative, then obviously there are no uh, roots, or there are no solutions to this. There, there is no x that solves that. So a little bit of mathematics. Who is happy to go back to primary school? Like, we love that. It's like good memories. So, and this is all static. So it cannot be more static. Yeah. Great. Now, we do a small change. It is again static. But what I did, okay, it will be, there is a difference. So we are looking at the stop method, m static void. It returns void here, and here it returns double. Yeah? So, only thing I, I do a little bit more here because I'm summing all the uh, all the roots as a result and returning that. There is a reason for that. You will see. And now I go full object oriented. I just read a book. I know object oriented uh, programming. Learn in a weekend. Learn in 21 hours. And that's the code I'm writing. So there is infer interface for quadratic equation which calculates roots. Then. Delta goes to the different interface. And you know, if we have interfaces, so now I'm basically in a virtual method for roots. I'm even calling another virtual method for delta. And yeah, cannot be more virtual, yes? And then uh, finally, OK, this is the real code, the method uh, mvirtual, which basically creates this implement, uses implementation, Q1, Q1 D1, great names again, and then makes a virtual call to and calculates roots. So it's not that much different from a static call, it's just now uh, the, the most important calls are virtual. And now I measure it, and that's the result. What do you see here? Okay, let's go back to the Fast. Okay, maybe, maybe. Why do you trust me even? Why do you trust me? Okay. Mm, was it this call? Okay, uh, I know. So, sorry, um, I will be talking about this tool. Mm. And maybe, 
Okay, that will not be as stable. I hope it is enough. We'll have to wait a little bit. Mm. Who knows what, what I'm running? And actually, I'm not even sure if I get the expected result. If not, then, oh, 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 oh. Uh, oh yeah, I know what has happened. Uh, demo effect, sorry, I will make it bigger. And, oh, no, 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 again, sorry. <sighs> Why? This should be this. And we'll wait, and during that time, uh, who thinks this will now show completely different results to make me confused? <laughs> Can happen. Like, <laughs> I was doing this kind of stuff a few times, and there were moments when I was confused. I am ready for that. I will just run away if the result is not as I expect. But we'll see. So there can be one place when it actually gives totally different results, but I don't see it right now. OK, we'll just wait a little bit. <sighs> okay, okay. So basically, do not trust that my lesson number one from this presentation, if someone presents you benchmarks, just you always are, you can be, you can assume those numbers are faked. If someone shows you something like this, then you maybe I written actually a bash script to present these numbers, but you never know. But Maybe you can try it on your own. So we have more or less similar results. Uh, we don't have exactly the same results because you know, now I'm running more stuff on my machine and maybe I change a little bit, but we have the same things. Like M1 static is the fastest. And why is it the fastest? So here I'm calling benchmark. So why, uh, no, no, M1 static unit. Sorry, just going back. M1 static unit, this is it. So why? This thing, control. Why is this thing the fastest? Who has idea? Yeah, Mario. Because JMA is not really executed in it because it's slow. Yeah. The the answer here is uh, let me translate. If if you run no code, it is the fastest. Because JVM is actually smart enough to see, yo, you are calculating something, bro, but you are not returning any result, you are not doing any side effects, so, so I will save you a little bit of time. Uh, I will be very ecologic, so do not do this calculation, less energy used. Okay, if you wanted to actually hit your room with this method, that's how you actually fail. You have to learn about other time types of hitting, I don't know, write it in a C++, C++, Compiler doesn't sometimes know that something is as used, so it's much better for hitting your apartment. But this is basically optimization. The code was never actually uh, executed. So, okay, it was interpreted initially, maybe, or something else we've seen. I didn't actually look, and it's not that easy to look exactly what has happened, but basically wasn't executed. So here, I'm returning the result. And by returning this result, I made a uh, JVM believing, it's not only that I return this result here, I will show you, you have to do something else as well, but now JVM believes that I actually need this number for something, yeah. Uh, so, uh, and now it actually executed this code. But why was virtual call as fast as static? Sorry? Yeah, so JVM is actually smart enough during this C1, C2, I have actually no idea, I haven't checked, compilation, it's so, oh, there is only one implementation of this. Why would that really make a virtual call? Let's make it actually static. Even more, what can happen, it can be inline. Who knows what is inline method? So inline method is, means that you don't even have a call to method, you actually, the body of the method is inserted. So actually, JVM uses quite aggressive inlining. If, uh, if the method can be inlined, quite often is inlined. So this is, if someone has a C++ background and me, inlining virtual method is a really crazy thing. But here, there was no real virtual. Like, this was virtual, let's say, in only in code. But practically, it was static. So JVM seen there is only one implementation, so let's get uh, 
let's get uh, static with that, let's say, and use it as static. So here we even see that virtual was faster, and basically I consistently get this, but this is a little bit faster, so I don't care that much, but for some reason it is. Moment, just I'm checking if it's here as well. Oh, here virtual was a little bit slower, so a little surprise, maybe I used different version of JVM. But more or less we can say they are equal. So, yeah. Uh, now, so we have some idea. If you only use one implementation, you don't pay for that. So all those guys that were telling you don't use interfaces because it will only make your code slower. Because why, what's the point of using interface if you have only one implementation? It's only a cost. Actually, you see, that doesn't cost anything. So uh, the having interfaces or not having interfaces is a matter of code quality, of your style, and you can decide this is better or, or something other is better, but it's not a point for, for performance, at least here in this small case. So we'll go uh, to something deeper, uh, similar. So what if I actually have more in implementations? So I have, uh, so there is a record point x, y, and I have an interface metric, which basically calculates this one, distance between points. And basically there is something in mathematics called metric space, and there is no, not only one way to calculate distance between uh, points. So for instance, there is something called taxi metric, uh, so New York metric, they have different names, but basically says, it's not the square, it's not the, just the closest uh, distance between the points, but we measure it as if we were driving a taxi. So honestly, uh, someone uh, creating this name haven't really drove, uh, wasn't really uh, using real taxis, which actually, you know, sometimes use the longest distance between the two points, but you know, let's pretend this was an honest taxi driver, it happens. So, so if, the, if the streets are, let's say, orthogonal to each other, that's the distance we would cover. And there is like maximum metric, uh, another is basically what is bigger, distance on X, on Y, and this is also a valid metric. And then I created two invalid metric. I don't get why those are, let's say, invalid, but they do the job here, so serve as some implementation. Maybe I just wanted to exactly test which metric is valid. So I have x, y, so this, so distance between points is only distance on x or distance on, or on y. So I have four implementations of this, of this interface. I put them in an array, and I have, uh, I have greatly named method m1, which accepts some modulo. And basically it means, uh, what it does, it chooses the metric using this modulo. So if it's modulo two, it means, if modulo is two, it means like uh, I will only, I will ch choose taxi uh, each time it's even, or uh, max each time it's odd. So if it's three, then I will be using three of them. If it's four, four of them. And by the way, if uh, modulo is one, it means I will be always choosing taxi. So that's a method, and now I call it for, okay, Maybe why should I do this? I'll, uh, let me go into case to two. Okay. Oh, you see, not really well. So it is M1 with one. You see, this is actually really e easy. M1 with two, and then I have V3, V4, and additionally, I used the same as if I was calling static, so basically, we go there, there's a static version for that. I'm just using some distance method, which is basically uh, uh, the same as taxi. Now, let me call that. So this is case to two, and we'll wait a little. Again, anything can happen. This is a live presentation. Let's make it bigger. Now we'll have to wait one minute, and again, might not be the best uh, way to do a benchmark when on this machine right now there are tons of things running, but we'll see. Faster, faster, faster. So who guesses the results? Yeah? Sorry? Oh, I, I, okay, I can show that. Mm, let's close it. It's a, it's a fixed amount of points, and I have it, I have it somehow pre-calculated here. So there is a static uh, array of 100 points that I randomly make them, and then I basically 
call in a loop on uh, choosing two of those points and between all the uh, all of them I'm, I'm calculating that. So 100 by 100, so I am calculating 100. Oh, actually, yes or no? Oh, you know, this code is too complex for me to analyze. But let's say it's something like 10,000 or rather, no, if 5,000 distances I'm measuring here. Okay, so maybe I already have results. No, I don't. But yeah, so what's your guess? Oh, so we have some reasons. I have to check if it's good. Uh, it didn't really work. Uh, it's actually okayish, but not as great. Maybe I didn't use enough time. Uh, as great as I wanted to be, but we see that mm, uh, it's really visible. It's not that stable. But what we see is that V1 was generally a little bit faster uh, than v V2, and V3 and V4 was actually slowest. And static was somehow, yeah, between. I would say this result really shows that I had, oh, you see that? There is an error. This error is huge enough to disqualify this result. It's uh, too big. Probably I was making something on the screen. So this time, let's uh, go to uh, faked numbers that I prepared for this presentation. Uh, but those are much better than the real ones. But OK, as you see, uh, they're uh, more or less similar. It's just those. Here I have a little bit better errors, and this was less random. Still, yeah, could, uh, and I actually called it more times. So you see that each time I was calling nine times uh, the, the, the benchmark, not three less here, and then taking average. So you see that static and V1 are again similar. This time static was faster. V2 is also relatively fast. Actually, it's way faster than, uh, okay, it's a little bit faster than V1 for some reason. Yeah, this is crazy. Uh, and I would say still this was probably wasn't the best uh, benchmark done I could. Uh, and then V3, V3, V4 is like that. So remember, actually, we always had four implementations. But what is the difference? There were always four. So JVM, actually, if it checks how many implementations do, ha do have, four. But on this particular loop, JVM was able to find out, oh, you have four implementations, but you are using one. Well, that's good enough for me to make it static, let's say. Then you had two implementations. What happened? So JVM basically then knew, OK, you, have, you are using only two implementations. So I will put a, instead of really doing polymorphic call, I will write them somewhere. Let's say this is either this method or that, and I put some if. So basically, these are, uh, those things are you can read about about monomorphic. So there is only one implementation, bimorphic call. And then when there are three, basically JVM gives up. When you, if, you, if it sees, oh, in this loop, I am using three implementations, it means, oh, I'm just doing normal polymorphic call, which is a little bit slower. It's visible slower. And V4 is the same. OK, there are more than two, then do it. So, Polymorphic, so that's why V3 and V4 are more or less the same. So you see, uh, it actually doesn't depend how many implementations you have in this particular code. It depends how many you use. And you can do funny trick. I, I didn't uh, do it here. OK, if we have time, we can try. What if I just, at the end of this loop, uh, for instance, when I am only using one metric, when I call just at the end, the other implementations. What would happen? That's a good uh, uh, exercise we can try later. If someone wants to see that, uh, it'll just remind me. Okay, so let's go to the next point. And this one is crazy. I've stolen it from, okay, sorry, I forgot the name, but one of the great speakers from Azul. And this one was when my mind was like a little bit surprised. So. Have you ever seen uh, what is those method? What are those method doing? So x is integer. Oh, sorry, I don't. Mm, maybe case two, three. Yeah. So we'll just look at it in the source code. So x is this integer, and then we try to make a string of this this way. Who have seen this kind of a conversion to string from int? Yeah. 
who basically tries to kill someone when you see this type of conversion, like your colleagues, like, okay, not kill, but you know, you, you think bad words about them, yeah? Yeah, that's what we actually do. Yeah, and I've seen uh, hundreds of those. But we are, let's say, wiser, so maybe we use this kind of string builder, not buffer, append. So is it better? Not anymore. <laughs> not anymore, but okay. This is like this. And then I even do something strange, like I will do the same as here, uh, just only I will use fluent interface, and I will put uh, additional quotation here, and then to string. And by the way, at the end, let's say the baseline for that, how it could be done, well, or string value of, it's one of the, let's say, the best choices here. But we'll look at all, all these results, okay? So again, a little bit of time. Okay, it's two, three. Uh, actually now, uh, because of the JVM I'm using, I won't get the best results, but we'll get something. The best, I mean the most uh, crazy, but we should see something. Uh, one minute. One minute is okay. So, do do do. So, so which method will be the fastest? Who can guess? Last one. Okay, you are right. The last one is basically the fastest. Uh, and you should already see something. But what would be the second one? First one, yeah. Who thinks it's really crazy? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, we'll just wait in like 30 seconds. Yeah, so you know everything about it. So, so who has seen this uh, uh, example before? Yeah, some of you have seen that. Yeah, great. So you're attending this talk. So yeah, this is stolen from a presentation, other presentation I, uh, I, I attended. So yeah, this is really... I love it. I love it. Okay, so as you see, like int to string, so the correct one is the fastest, but naive x, this naive implementation right here was the more or less the same speed. It's actually statistically it's insignificant given different. But this is even more crazy. So we had builder, look at this, we had builder when he appended x and did to string. And then here we have builder that we also appended empty string, and it was faster. Sorry? Which? Okay, we can, yeah, for some reason it's actually, I haven't, why it's, why it disregards this call? No, it actually does it, but okay. The explanation for that, there is no logical explanation when you go into the bytecode. Where do you have to go into this? Sorry? Yeah, you have to go, the answer is here, correct. You have to go to the JVM compiler. And, okay, so I had like these results. Actually, I got more crazy now than on my run, but I, and I feel really offended that the naive solution is, okay, here is what was even the best. I like, really, that hurts a lot. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> what happened? So JVM, basically the vendors of JVM, what they try to do is exactly what those vendors of CPUs make code constructs that are most often used faster. So. Remember this story about branches, that we were trying to not make branches in assembly, but nevertheless, if you are just a regular developer, you mostly do write code that the branches are taken. That's why uh, CPU vendors changed the strategy, branch taken, uh, like long time ago. Now it's more advanced guessing. But more or less, this is also still holds that assumption is the branch is taken. So here, JVM vendors seen, okay, most of the people do this crazy conversion with this empty string plus integer. So let's make this code fast. Let's find this pattern actually in the bytecode. Let's look at the bytecode. Do we see that someone is doing exactly this? Yes. So replace it with the native, let's say, call. It's actually more than native. I will, I will go back to that. To the native call to just con conversion. 
basically looks at the pattern in a bytecode. And why this builder what was uh, 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 faster? If you, because this actually originally, this x plus uh, uh, empty string plus x, x was converted originally before JVM, I don't know, JDK9 or something, or when I'm talking about Oracle based, it was converted to this kind of, uh, to this kind of uh, code by Java C. Now, already Java C, from some version, actually compiles it to the completely crazy code with I invo invoke dynamic. But this uh, optimization for exactly this pattern is still in the code of JVM. Even though if you use modern Java C, you won't, uh, you won't get, uh, uh, it will produce a little bit different result. Oh, maybe we can check it. Okay, who wants to see? Okay, no, no, later, later, I, later. Not because, yeah, well, I feel offended by that. Oh, actually I prepared that, I forgot. So this is join naive, you see invoke dynamic. Actually now Java uses invoke dynamic, even though you learned actually it's not used by Java, it's used, yeah. It's uh, in, uh, for, for this particular case, yeah. Uh, uh, so this is, uh, uh, th then this, this is uh, join uh, with a string builder, the, the slowest one, yeah. So you see the huge difference. But here, basically, not only it produces some crazy uh, code by Java C, it's also that JVM has a special, um, let's say, takes special care of those code, yeah. And takes special care of the code, which is actually longer than this, but has, uh, 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 appends uh, empty string in front. Okay, so, okay, uh, basically, yeah, uh, implemented in a special way. This is this is hard coded in the JVMs. Yeah, maybe some of them hard coded. So basically, there are, there are some constructs uh, which are basically replaced. Let's say hard way, hard coded by that. Then you have intrinsics. Who knows what the intrinsic is? Okay, what is intrinsic? Yeah, so basically, the set of instructions that uh, replaces patterns in a, in a bytecode. And so, actually, you can read uh, what, uh, there are pages which have uh, lists of, uh, of these special intrinsics in a JVM, and you know, particular versions, particular vendors. And most of those methods, so on the right, we have some method from Java. And if you look at the code, on the source code, you have this SRC zip. Whoever looked at what's in the sources of platform? Yeah, that's, you should be looking some. But then you see native call. But it's not really native. It's actually detected by uh, JVM that, oh, you wanted to do this power uh, and you did it in a hot method, then I actually replace it with some specifically crafted code for that. And that's it. So by the, it means also that uh, intrinsic are not really m native calls. Why does it matter? Sorry? Okay, in a, in a way, but the point is that if you, if you ever tried the real GNI, who had tried GNI, Java native interface? What can you tell about it? Sorry? Yeah. <laughs> terrible. Well, what else can you tell about it? It's very slow, so actually, let's say jumping from a Java code into the native code is particularly slow. So when we were, if we are doing in a loop some mathematical calculations, and we were doing, if we were doing that with a real native JNI calls, it would be really slow. So luckily, it's not. No, no one really does here. Uh, I think no serious JVM actually does real native call, even though those methods are marked as native. So okay, so we have some, we we know some tricks about Java JVM. So how can we look at the JVM? Who knows JConsole? Okay, so I will now start some code. Uh, again, maybe not the most, uh, let's say, the most wise code. Uh, this will be in, a, in a Kotlin, so surely it won't be uh, really wise. But nevertheless, uh, okay, no, 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 no. I'm wanting to run a simulator here. Okay, yeah, this one. Okay, just running, oh, okay, sorry, stop that. 
I have to get out of the. Yeah, I will. I wanted to show, but I am something, but I am too fast. I run this code like that. So what it does, it doesn't matter. It does some crazy stuff with accounts. Oh, maybe, maybe I will show that actually. Okay, this code, this code simulates that we are a bank and we have. A, a, I don't know how many citizens we have in this bank. Let's look at the simulator. We have uh, mm, do, 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 simulator. We have we are simulating that we have thousand accounts and we are doing random transfers between these accounts. And bank is more or less there is account uh, which has withdraw method and deposit method. There is bank which basically is a mutable hash map of accounts. We have some logs, whatever. It doesn't really matter. The point is. This is your production code. You know nothing about it because you know you are taking care about performance, not the you know boring business logic. So we might want to look at it. And now this is the first way we can do it. We can start the J console. And so who didn't know J console before? Yeah, some people. So this is for you. So J console is your one of the tools you might use. Uh, okay, J console allows me to. Okay, uh, the problem with that is uh, 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 just before this, this, this presentation, the UI became really ugly, and I have no idea what happened, and, but I won't fix. It's probably Linux. So it really looks ugly, but it still works. Mm. Okay, so what we see here? We are just looking at the dashboard of the running JVM. We have heap memory usage, we have threads, we see that there's like 50 something threads. Okay, this is really uh, not that visible. We have, uh, what do we have? Classes, almost two and a half thousand classes. I only wrote three. It's a little bit too much, but okay, that's not my problem. But I'm just analyzing and here, here I see that there is a 30% CPU usage. And then I can switch to memory. Yeah, heap memory usage. What else? Like add and space. So today I won't cover really like uh, what is Elden, what is uh, Survivor, what is, what is like Metaspace, you should read on your own. But, okay, it's really not, but you would see for instance here that you have a memory problem, yeah? Because you will, uh, you will see that this goes up and to some extreme number and for instance constantly grows up. So here we see that we are constantly claiming some memory, allocating and deallocating its state. So this application doesn't seem to have a memory problem. Then we have threads, and we can use, for instance, that's a cool thing. We can look at the thread and check what it's doing. How, how nice, I love it. I really love it. And as we see, most of those threads are doing exactly nothing. This is also nice. If they are not doing anything, they are really fast. But okay. And then we have uh, summary. This is actually very useful. So uh, when I connect to the JVM, I can check uh, which, uh, uh, the at, at which attributes it was called with. Oh, I, I see that I used, uh, okay, this is IntelliJ. This is because of IntelliJ. It used additional options. That's not, that wasn't my intention. And then I know which Oracle version, and that's even more crazy. Who knows this thing? Sorry? Yeah. So basically, inside of the JVM, you, b you have some additional, let's say, bins from JMX that you can, not, not you can, for instance, uh, what it would be interesting, Java Lang, you can look at the uh, unloaded classes, okay, and then, oh, uh, classes count, oh, I don't, I see zero, total, it seems, oh, that works, like two and, a, so basically all the internals, like, m like not all, but, Many metrics are exposed this way, and the external tool can use that, can make some dashboards. So when you enter some company and you see these dashboards presenting stuff from a working JVM production, it, it's quite often it really just comes from this. Okay, so that's one thing, but JConsole is basically basic diagnostic tool. Uh, you can use uh, to see what is more or less going on. And but this is much better tool. What if we start with print compilation? Who knows this? So some of so this is if you investigate some problem. Okay, there is one a little bit more than one hour left, but we'll do it. 
So if you investigate some problem, maybe you want to uh, start the JVM with this print compilation. Why? Because one of the things you want to know if, if some critical methods that were really critical for your business are really compiled, and sometimes exactly on this screen you will see not nice things like uncommon trap, but basically you want to see high numbers here. What is this number? It's uh, you have a method, so you see, for instance, maybe, okay, as usually it's very hard to find a method from, from your real code, uh, as I would say, just an, as in Spring, but yeah. For instance, this, is, this means that uh, there was a method, citizen act, that was called multiple times and was actually compiled to level three uh, by, uh, by, by JVM. Uh, why? Because, uh, okay, if I go to simulator, what this method does, oh, it's, uh, sorry, wrong code. Because it's a method how I create from long uh, a name of account, and it's so often used that it actually was compiled very, very early. No surprise. Then I have method register because initially I was, so this is actually from a startup of the application. I was registering multiple citizens that are now customers of the bank. Then. Uh, what else? Oh, this is this is something. So we see uh, this account in it, and actually now something I cannot fully uh, fully understand why it's uh, here again compiled the same with the same level. No idea. I wasn't prepared to answer that. Uh, but we can we can we can see more, uh, and I will show you later. Yeah. But here I have no, actually no idea. Uh, okay. So we have some more. Bank transfer, three, three, bank account deposit, okay. Uh, do we have some more? In it, in it, or oh, in it. Uh, I, I'm looking for a specific pattern. Uh, this means that there was exception handler actually created for this method, interesting. Uh, just a more stuff. Okay, I don't see one thing yet. Um, okay. Oh, four. It was three before, now it's four. So it means it was used more, so now it's compiled by the next stage. So basically three is like, let's say, C1, four is C2. It's not, let's say, these names C1, C2 are not used anymore. But this is interesting. Who knows what does it mean? Mate not entrant. So if you have a method that is compiled by JVM, so you have a native code for that. You have like a, let's say you can think of it, I have a hash map where there is a method name, signature actually, and, uh, and if whenever I want to execute this method, I look in this, let's say, hash map and I go there. But, so if I had the method random transfer that was compiled with a level three, and now I have with a level four, as long as this level three is still executed, we actually still have it, because maybe some, some threads are still working inside this level three compiled. But now what we do, we compile with four, and almost immediately we say, but please never ever enter, uh, never, never enter to three. So continue with this three as long as you have running code inside this three, uh, three third level compiled. But then all the, all, all the new uh, entrances will go to this four. So for, uh, okay, so that's basically how we switch. So mate not entrance means we have a better version of this code. Don't call it anymore. Uh, and it goes, uh, ah, I want to see something. Probably I don't have in, in, okay. I don't see, okay. I don't have any fails, but basically that's how it goes and if you are analyzing the code uh, that it's basically performing like, uh, too slow or something, you want to see that method was really compiled. And sometimes you see that it's not, or it's decompiling, there is something called uncommon trap uh, or something like that. And then you know there is a problem because for some reason your method cannot be compiled. Some, sometimes uh, when the code is very crazy, it's exactly what uh, JVM is saying, telling you. you know, I, I won't compile this method, I don't like it. So you can read about this prompt compilation, what it does. Now we have uh, 
another thing, print inlining, it's print compilation is quite useful, I would say, when you have some stuff. Print inlining, much less. I would say uh, that is more interesting to see that than it's actually useful. So print inlining does more or less the same thing as print compilation, but only shows what was inlined. And again, sometimes we have small methods that we expect should be inlined, but they are not for some reason. Here I typically is described what is happening, but looking for that is quite crazy. So, uh, and JVM is actually showing you what sometimes method is too big. Uh, oh, that's, now it's mixed with the output of the code. But okay, it will eventually we will find also inline method here, and uh, sometimes you will see why the the method wasn't inline. Just let me. Uh, it's too five. Uh, not inlining. It is a non-intrinsic native method. For instance, it means that doesn't uh, JVM doesn't doesn't inline it because it. Uh, uh, is a, it is a native method that is not intrinsic, and then it leaves it as, uh, let's say, uh, it inserts the code, not really inlines it. So that's not the problem, but sometimes you will see such messages that it's not inlining because of so some other problems. For instance, if you, okay, skip it, don't worry. I don't want to go to too many details. And obviously, whenever you're actually running something, you should use this. Because sometimes only that will show you a lot of problems. So this is not how the typical uh, GC log looks like. I made it crazy because I limited the memory uh, um, uh, heap for this. But you see full GC, concurrent MARS cycle, so you know which garbage collector was used. And you see young generations, full generations. And uh, normally, you would see that. Let me, oh, you know, six megabytes. Wow. I will make it like a small number, but more reasonable, like this. Okay. Now, so it actually, this application works with six megabytes. And now you see, okay, also a lot, but n there never happens anymore uh, full GC and nothing like that. And basically, uh, one thing you track in garbage collector you don't want to see often full garbage collection. If you see often full garbage collection, you know something is wrong. And that's probably maybe you don't have a memory leak, but you produce too much garbage. OK. So let's go to the uh, to next step. So we have all, I don't have time, sorry. It's deep dive, that not that deep that you, know, you will fall asleep. Who can tell me what's the best garbage collector out of this? OK, you, sorry. Epsilon. Epsilon, yes. Why? Because I put uh, <laughs> exclamation marks. OK, why Epsilon is great and why it's important for you? Yeah, so Epsilon is a, is a garbage collection that never does any garbage collection. Where well, it makes sense to use it? When? Sorry? OK, so you are doing high frequency trading. No, OK, no. So there are some applications that want to avoid garbage collection at all, and high frequency trading is one of those things. Oh, but that's not my domain, even though I'm a little bit close to that, but uh, not that really crazy. But if you are doing performance management, you are optimizing CPU, maybe Sometimes you want to not see all these um, random pauses done by GC. So you might use sometimes Epsilon, just to avoid all this randomness. Even if your code is maybe producing some garbage, but you put, I don't know, 2 gigabytes, uh, 10 gigabytes, and then you run your benchmark, and you know that this benchmark is not affected by, uh, by garbage collection. So it's not that it's that much often used, this epsilon for that, but that's one of the cases when you want it. Out of, uh, when it comes to other garbage collections, there was a great answer here. It depends what you are doing. Uh, you have to know, you have to read more or less why one of them are better for particular jobs. So basically, there is always a trade-off. You either have smaller poses, but the garbage collector is relatively heavy. It constantly runs a little bit and slows down your entire machine. Or you have 
very performant garbage collector, which means your, also your machine is performing better, but then you have pauses, like it will just stop for half of a second. So depends, for instance, maybe this is a server uh, batch that it doesn't matter if it, if it stops for five uh, seconds or something, then for instance, you could use serial garbage, garbage collector. Depends also how many cores you have and stuff like that. And honestly, multiple times I solved production issues changing garbage collection mm, attributes, switching garbage collector and changing uh, numbers because all of them can be tuned. Never I had idea what I was doing. So typically, whenever I was changing, I was tuning garbage collector, I was getting the opposite results of expected. But then I continued experimenting un until I was getting, let's say, performance that was uh, good enough for me. But I don't think it's something I can call science. It is dark, dark magic. I just, you know, you change something, you get crazy results. Oh, so for instance, you, you extend, I don't know, add-in space, you would expect now it should be faster, it's actually slower. You know, you don't, I, maybe there is a book that can explain that, never found any. Uh, okay, mission control and flight recorder. So, so, okay, just get into this. <laughs> JMC. Okay, and now okay, I will run it with garbage collector. And it should be here. So what's, what is Java Mission Control useful for? It's a great tool to show nice uh, looking gouges. You will see, just a moment. So if you want to impress someone uh, not really investing a lot of time, uh, call, use this tool mm, and yeah. It looks awesome. So I'm connecting to the real JVM and there are like, wow, there is like speedometers going on. That's really awesome. But actually this is, all, uh, not only it presents nice uh, pictures, it's only also useful for something like this. Start flight recording. So who has heard about it? Okay, so flight recording is basically small, okay. Uh, it's a feature of, let's say, Oracle-driven JDKs. Uh, I think it actually started in JRocket, but I'm not sure. This always a little bit looks like a JRocket. Uh, but, so all, let's say, not anymore used uh, JVM, but uh, it's a tool that, as a flight recorder and in an airplane, it records what's happening. So that you can later reuse that. And basically, it has all the details about garbage collector, but even used methods and stuff like that. I can, uh, in fact, uh, uh, drop it. Oh, it's okay. Again, I wanted to pause it, but it doesn't really progress. Oh, I can stop it here, but it will be still useful. So, now I will have a screen about uh, method profiling. Uh, for instance, it even says to me that the most sample method was transfer. Maybe you should do something with this method transfer. Actually, okay, there is more to that, it's, uh, and, but I don't wanna spend a lot of time with this, uh, with this tool because potentially we, can, we have even better. What is cool about flight recorder and mission, con uh, flight recorder, basically, the idea of flight recorder is that you can potentially use it on production. So it means that it doesn't slow down your application that much. Mm, I actually never used it on production anywhere, but that's what they promise. Okay. I'm using different tool that I just show a picture. Okay. So, so uh, we'll go to tools now, uh, let's say quickly, because uh, really times go so fast. So couple of breaths, yeah, questions? Okay, no, no question. You are tired. So maybe we should stand. Okay, just who is not already fallen asleep for you, just so you can actually uh, get my message for the last hour, like just please stand up. Just, you, you, you may you just stand up, like please. Let's, you know, it's a small exercise. Otherwise your brains will fall asleep. Like, 
OK, great. And now we make wave, yeah? <laughs> you, you sit, and everyone sits in a wave. Like, from right, sit, sit, great, great, great. And, OK, now, wait, let's make a one wave on another, so sorry. Like, stand up, and let's make one wave. So it's really for, it's really for this lecture. Like, one wave, the next stand, stand up, let's make wave from the left side. Or, yeah, and you stand, you sit down, yeah, okay. And now a wave of sitting. Great, you're awesome, yeah. Sorry for that, but we, we are after lunch, and this is a tough. And I hope now, now you're ready for more crazy stuff. Okay, so tools. Because that was the core of my talk. That's why it's at the end, the tools. Uh, so I'm not showing all the tools that are needed when you are uh, investigating problems, because there are tons of them on production, whatever. And I'm not showing this. So for instance, this is uh, something that if you are in a, um, let's say, rich company that has a lot of money, you can have tools like this. There are multiple of them. Like, OK, few of them. And Dynatrix is one of them, so you basically connect it to production. And now whenever something happens, you know what's going on. And then you pay, you know, hundred thousand dollars for using this tool. But sometimes it's actually, if it's really critical thing, it's uh, sometimes you want to do something. Okay, so, but we'll assume we have nothing or we just want, don't want to invest much money. And actually, there are plenty of free tools that you can use. Uh, but before that, what kind of problems we analyze? We have slow responses, too much CPU is used, too much RAM uh, is used, or too much CPU. Who has ever heard this U limit, U limit, U limit? Who had problem with that? Yeah. So this is, unfortunately, there is no, uh, what is still typical problem? Sometimes when you have a production, it just says, yeah, too many files open, basically, and you have to increase limits. And sometimes, yeah, because administrator of the system, the, let's say, uh, someone put a crazy limit, so uh, sometimes it's because you have some kind of a leak. But that's usually easy to track, not that easy to solve, because you have exact error message. But yeah, we have some problem with resources. First thing, never go, let's like, say, blindly, we'll just make it better because it's a road without no end. So typically, for instance, you should set a goal. Like, I have 10 gigabytes of RAM. It uses 10 gigabytes of RAM, but I can, we can only afford 2 gigabytes on this server for reasons. Maybe it's on a Docker. Maybe we pay for this. I don't know. And may, maybe we, sh we see that 90% of responses are under 2 seconds, and we need to, them to be under 1 second. And I put it uh, like this. Because that's very important. So many times I've seen even in contracts that we guarantee that responses will be served faster than two seconds, like 100%. Is it even possible with Java? Is it possible with C++? Basically, any hard number you put here, like 100% of requests is served in one day, mostly. Is it OK? No, this still makes real-time system. And in basically, in most of the systems we do, we cannot guarantee 100%, because there can be many things. Like Windows, if it's on the Windows, can decide it's update time, and I will be updating the whole day. I don't know who actually puts production on Windows, but there were those crazy times. But you know, a lot of things can happen. And basically, we are never producing real-time systems. OK, in this area of Java, we are making, let's say, soft real-time or something like that, and we guarantee that 90% response. That basically don't go into real-time and know about it, because otherwise, I actually have seen the companies that had that in the contract, and I could only tell, sorry, that's not doable. And always there will be this request that, I don't know, for some reasons, and that might not even be Java, that might be OS or some hardware, it's complex, will be like, will put, it, put you beyond limit. So you need to have some goals, and those must be realistic. Uh, re making realistic goals of uh, known hardware, so it's other problem, but I cannot cover it today. There are some numbers, basically baselines, that you know, for instance, you cannot serve more than that number of requests on the machine, etc. But I don't want to put those numbers, because that you will learn them, and I will be in trouble. So, But basically, if you have some problem, 
like performance, typically you can initially solve it. Like you, I, I see this is not the best algorithm, I may do better, but this is the job that has no end. So any non-trivial code you, s you take, you can optimize garbage collection, you can optimize code, you can mm, optimize uh, tune settings of JVM. If you spend infinite number of time, it will be perfect. But normally you don't have infinite number of time. You, that's why you need to set some goals. But honestly, I've seen people forgetting about it. Basically whole teams, whole companies forgetting about it. Like we constantly make it better even though it's, it's already good enough. This is also a number I taken, I, I cannot really mm, prove this number. It's only from experience that only three or to five percent, depends on the application, is a hot code that you should, should be improved, you should improve, you should take care about it. But the rest of the code you can forget because this is a code that, let's say, reading configuration. Does it matter if the configuration read at the beginning of application is slow? Sometimes, because maybe you are exactly the, this, this, uh, you have this uh, application that has to start fast, but mostly not. So the question is, where is this three, five persons? And that's my tool number one. And I actually talked to even people, speakers like me, people doing performance, that's exactly tool number one. Who has heard about it? So what it does? Sorry? Thread dump. So basically, uh, if you, again, if you use some Oracle driven, but I think all the serious JVM support it, if you, it doesn't kill actually process, despite the name. It sends a signal, but what it does, it's on the standard output of the process, you will get something like that. Thread dump with all the, all the threads and some information about garbage collection. And this tool is ugly. But sometimes it's the only thing you have. Because someone installed some production that was not a company that specialized in running Java applications, so they knew nothing about you know, monitoring or stuff. They just made something running, and now it doesn't work properly. And the only thing you have is this. Yeah. And funny, but it does the job. What do you do? You do a couple of these dumps, and then you analyze with some diff tool What's quite often here? Well, I'm typically looking for the longest stack trace. And quite often, it's absolutely, it's not really, there is no knowledge behind it. It's just experience, but not only mine. Quite often, longest stack trace exactly shows where the problem is. If not the longest, then you see what's uh, constantly appearing there. You do it a couple of times, like sampling, I will, I will tell later about it, and you have it. But the more professional tool for that, it exactly does more or less the same is JSTack. So who has heard about it? So if you look at some JDK, now let me go to okay, uh, CD. Okay, maybe from a, I will need this command line. CD. My JDK science are installed here. Candidates, Java. I will choose uh, maybe this 18 from Oracle. There are some tools here, and among them is JSTAT. And what JSTAT does is exactly dumps the stack trace. With one nice feature, it doesn't cause the process to dump on its STD out, it dumps it in, in a console we are running JSTAT. So if you are having these tools, if on the server is JSTAT, you are already more lucky. And uh, sometimes it's uh, installing these tools, all of them, from JDK is one of the things when I, for instance, I'm, I'm trying to solve a problem in some command and I ask them, please do me a favor and install this JDK so I can have better tools for analysis. Or the, most of them are command line tools and I will show you more of them, but they really do the job. Obviously, they are not perfect. Command line processing is not great as always, but it allows you to, uh, to see something. Oh, Maybe you want to see which Java processor are running. This is basically PS, so processes, but for Java, so JPS. By the, what the second form is doing, MLVV, it's extremely verbose. And I'm basically, my hand when I write JPS always at this second one. So well, that's the same when I'm using RM, then I put minus RF instantly. Uh, you know that, yeah. It's very healthy uh, behavior. 
but then I, when I'm using JPS, I'm putting the second. Then I know which processes with, with which arguments are started. I know all about it. Yeah. So, well, let's see it. Ah, why not? Yeah, so it's, it's really verbose, but you see, for instance, this is this process, this is IntelliJ, and this has all these arguments. Oh, that's cool. So JSTAT is a more sophisticated utility, so it's like showing you uh, what is compiled, what is GC, uh, what is, uh, can show you compilation. Uh, you know what? I won't waste time showing all these things, because it uh, doesn't, uh, okay, or maybe, maybe. Ah, okay, no. Let's save this time. So basically, it, for instance, allows you to connect to existing process and have a dump of printing compilation. So you forgot about, you are interested, what is compiled. You can connect to already existing machine and dump what is now getting compiled. You've seen JConsole, but you haven't seen Visual VM. So maybe you are lucky that you can actually run J Visual VM. And by the way, it doesn't have to run on the same machine as a server. You can have a tunnel, to the server, and you can have a connection, and you can analyze remote machines. And Visual Machine, vis Visual VM, works uh, like that. Uh, programs. Mm. Okay. Again, I will just run something. Okay. This simulator of bank. I will try to connect it with Visual VM. Oh, so you see on the screen, and again, it's possible to connect to the remote applications. I want this. It takes a little bit of effort, but basically, you can do it. So I am now connecting, and it looks initially very similarly to Java, to the J console. And it's not accident, it's basically the same code base. It was the same code base. So you see some dashboard, but it has something more, like this one, sampler. So I'm just sampling my code. Ta -da -da. What I now do is I'm doing this stack traces and I see summary results, like total CPU time. I can stop it and maybe I can analyze the snapshot. What I see here, like maybe that's a better idea. OK, so I see, for instance, that method that's on top that uh, it even tell, tells me to analyze is this random transfer. So, but OK, let's, let's get, get into that. I see thread run, transfer. So I see that uh, there was a dump, and I've, I've seen so much time, like 10 seconds spent, uh, that this thread was running. But inside of running, uh, there was run transfer, and actually it spent 10 seconds inside this tra transfer, and then transfer, and then what was this lock? And actually, this is indication that maybe I'm locking too much. I just found the problem, you know, just looking at these samples. Maybe I found it, maybe not, but actually, it's a, this time I tell you it's a good guess. There is not optimal locking here in this uh, particular code, but yeah, we go farther. So that was sampling. Sampling is basically you send signals and you dump threads and you make statistics on that. How many times I was in a particular method. It has some problems. If you run code like this on an older JDK, like who is so uh, lucky that runs Java 8 on production? So some of you. Great. So if you run Java 8, you might have a problem, sometimes with sampling. OK, I will stop that. Uh, physics of JVM. OK, I'm not sure which Java version I started with. Java 8, OK. Oh, so I even use terminal. Mm -hmm. Somehow I don't see. Okay, I won't use terminal because I don't see uh, JPS. Okay, there is. So if I run JSTAC, uh, so basically probing of this 16, uh, 389. Sorry, it's small, but yeah, I get a thread dump. I do it again. I get it. Also, oh, does it really work? Seems to work. Maybe oh, it's still working. Oh, it doesn't work. So sampling has a small problem. It's called save point. Who has heard about save points? OK, so the save point is actually the thing of a, the nature of a JVM that it, when 
It wants to dump threads, actually in many more moments when it does garbage collection. It has to stop all the trade threads in a safe place. Safe place is basically some place that Java controls, like entering method, returning from method, some like um, calling I.O., something like stable place. But if your method is like full of mathematic CPU heavy calculations and doesn't call real methods inside, it's all intrinsic. So we, this generates a horrible, like huge native code assembly. And it doesn't, on a Java 8 particularly, it doesn't have anything like a safe one. It means that if you try to do a thread dump, and this is already compiled, initially we could, that, could do that, but after a while it was compiled, and in this moment we try to do a thread dump, it waits till all this method finishes, and sometimes it's a long time. It also means, that even if those methods are smaller, like they take one millisecond, the sampling doesn't show you the truth. It shows you something close to the truth. So it doesn't show you where really execution was. It shows you where, it, where JVM could stop threads after the execution. So it's a little bit skewed. It's not a perfect result. But it's mostly good enough. And by the way, this, oh, finally it ran, went. So, mm, but it took some time. So basically, it's, that's how we see uh, not really great results. But there is something else uh, um, uh, we can use. It's profiling. So profiling works in a different way. Mm, where is this bank code? OK, I will run bank more. So what is a profiling? So you have, we've, you've seen sampling, which has small problem. But you can also use profiling. Let me wait till it's available. It's not there. No, that's not. Oh, yeah, sorry, I haven't seen it, demo effect. So I will show you now profiler. Uh, how the profiler works? It basically instruments all the methods. It means, OK, all the methods, I will explain that. It puts inside of the, in, in the let's say, in the code of methods, some measurement points that now I see every time I enter something, what is really called. And first of all, if you put this instrumentation on all, or your, all, all the code of, I don't know, Java or whatever, you could do that, but your machine, like your uh, particular application will be incredibly slow. Uh, on the other hand, if you put on not too many things, like here is my profile. Okay, actually this is important and barely visible. It's, uh, it's actually, ex we'll see from the results moment, I will stop because you either can uh, exclude or include here. And I see that actually it's excluded. So it excluded all those packages. It doesn't really include only this. It shows more. So we see, for instance, Kotlin, next long, etc. But you see, I don't want to spend too much time, but you see uh, that this looks a little bit different. For instance, we don't see anywhere this lock, because lock comes from, uh, some, uh, from Java uh, util and you don't see it here. So with a profiling, so sampling is not perfect because it sometimes doesn't stop where, anywhere. It only can stop in some places. I, I say it's better in the modern JDK case, but it's still not perfect and will never mostly be. Profiling has other problem. First, you, sometimes you have to really configure which classes you analyze and you don't analyze because if you, uh, if you don't exclude anything, uh, basically this will all crash. If you exclude too much, you won't see stuff. So other way is to include only your classes, but then again, you won't see what's, ex for instance, here, self-time. It means here in internally, we spend a little bit of time of something that wasn't really there. And by the way, again, another problem, we see CPU time and we have total time. So not always. Uh, not for all cases, both are important. If, for instance, our application consumes a lot of CPU, like 100% CPU, for us it's important how much CPU we consume. But if, if our application is basically not consuming CPU, it's basically like 10% only on the system, but it's slow, then we want to see here. Maybe we just are locking. That's exactly what's happening in this application. But again, I would have to profile, put a different profile here, like include a, a specifically uh, lock 
in order to see uh, that it's actually locking. So that's a case where actually sampling was better than profiling, and it takes some time, unfortunately, uh, to learn that. It's like you have to experiment that. Otherwise, and it happened to me multiple times, you go to production, analyze something, and you see some results, and you know what, what's going on. No, you are just falling into some of the traps because your profiling shown you some, it's so shown you something wrong. Uh, remember physics. You know quantum physics. There is one rule in quantum physics: when you observe something, you change it. So sampling changes actually the behavior of application a little, but profiling changes it dramatically. The more you want to know about the application, the slower you make it actually and you can even cause it to be slow on the different places than it was originally. But there is no other basically option. You have to experiment and you have to get um, some, um, some uh, how to say that? that, you need to gather some experience. Uh, I don't have rules, but basically, yeah, to not embarrass yourself, check multiple times with different uh, classes to profile to confirm what you see. Uh, here is IntelliJ Profiler, which uh, will present you flame graph, so you can basically see here. Can you actually see what's happening? Uh, I don't really see that much here. So here is a lock, but not as important as it. So I haven't really checked. Uh, uh, so IntelliJ has a profiler that you can use for free. It's cool, so uh, uh, you can use this as well. If you, if, you, if you can connect uh, IntelliJ to the, to the application. Yeah? Then you have a heap dumps. I don't have time. The, so basically, analyzing of performance of CPU is actually way, way easier, at least for me, than analyzing heap dumps. If you have a real memory leak, analyzing, you can dump a heap uh, with this tool. And are, like, you can use Visual VM. And, but my lesson is that's also dark uh, matter. So basically, dark, dark magic. It's like it's really hard to sometimes track uh, where is the memory leak, and uh, that's one uh, that's methods on, on unprofessional methods that actually are working. So one is to put if you can change application, you can analyze. It's not that I would say uh, again. It's something that probably most of the professionals should laugh from, but it actually works. So exception that tells you where the object was created. So any professional tool, professional tool for analyzing uh, heap dumps, uh, memory leaks, tells that. But sometimes it's actually still not working as well as this. If you suspect, for instance, this class is, uh, is leaking, then you put this exception, and then you, for instance, find, uh, can find out who is actually creating this class. And second is even more crazy method, put uh, artificial huge object inside of the class. So if it's leaking, you will see out of memory sooner. It's also a crazy idea. I learned from one of the like, uh, also speakers on the conference. But this is like uh, actually working. Yeah? So you have two tons of tools, but those are like semi-manual, not really professional methods that also work. This is a lesson. What if you see, and if you use some, I don't know, special tool like Visual VM on JProfiler or any professional tool, you will see that quite often. There is an application, and thus, each time someone refreshes the page, it creates 1,000 of JDBC queries. Basically, it creates 1,000 of JDBC queries per second. And whenever we see that, we instantly think, oh, the database is overused. And you know how many times I've seen teams, even teams I worked for, spending time optimizing the uh, database, optimizing the queries, where actually, yeah, it was making tons of queries but that wasn't the problem. So it's hard to believe, but even sometimes we had hundreds of queries per second, or even thousands. But at the end, it was appearing that once we started to measure, that it all is like responsible for 2% of time, or 3%. And there was actual error somewhere else. But whenever we have this, like we see hundreds of queries, that must be an error. Maybe that is an error. Maybe it can be more efficient, but it's not the real bottleneck you have. So there, is, there are things like GDBC spy, basically proxy drivers that can allows you to dump uh, uh, queries. But remember that because that's a lesson I've seen a few times, that people were spending exactly, were not measuring where the problem is, just seen in a log there are hundreds of queries. That must be the problem. No, because sometimes those queries are really 
processed in milliseconds, and like even hundreds of them do not really bring any problem because database serves data from cache. And maybe they are even repeating, maybe that's not optimal, but really there were cases where that wasn't the problem. And actually I would say mostly that wasn't, more often that wasn't the problem that, that, than that was really a problem, to my surprise, because I hate databases and whenever I see a database I instantly think this is, must be wrong because there is a database. Okay, so finally we go uh, to science. What do I mean by that? So you had tools that lets you observe things. You observed, this is potentially slow, this is potentially, I know I can state hypothesis. So in this application, I would say locking. I've seen some locking with sampling. Uh, I would see that with profiling if I had more time, but basically now what I have to do is to approve, we, uh, we call it in the company I work for, a lab. So basically isolated environment when I can make an experiment. And this is a very important step. So uh, if, uh, if this is like service, you can use something like Gatling. So basically create a load test for HTTP. Uh, but sometimes, and I want to cover that, you can do micro benchmarks. So you have a piece of code that you suspect it's slow, or even better, actually you suspect, okay, it's performing slow and I know how to write it better. So then maybe you will write micro benchmark. It can even use database, whatever, it doesn't have to be real micro benchmark, but the idea is you start it from Java. So who has heard about JMH, not J -H -H M? Okay, there's a spelling mistake. Okay, so this is relatively simple, simple to set up a framework. It's a framework, and it has support from Maven, Gradle, SBT, whatever you want. And it's exactly framework that takes care or tells you how to take care about the problems in benchmarking, warm up. So, Mostly, you don't want to measure when the code is uh, compiling. You want to measure when it's run on a full speed, mostly. I, I would say almost always when you do something with Java. You want to be sure that the code wasn't, uh, you didn't have this dead code, uh, dead code actually eliminated. And what it has, it has uh, multiple uh, inner sources of JMH. You have multiple examples how to measure different stuff and the, the, uh, how, to, um, how to work with different problems. For instance, here is measure wrong. And that's how you do a benchmark. You just write a method as if it was unit test. Actually, you put it even in a separate folder, like you have SRC main, SRC test, and SRC JMH, for instance. And then you put these methods, where you call your code and measure wrong. Why it's wrong? Because maybe this compute x1 actually the result of that was never ever returned, so maybe it was, will be eliminated. So here is measure right correctly. You return everything, and you try to, sometimes it means that we have to, and that's what we do, that we have to provide some artificial result, like passing the result even if we are not interested in that. This is measure right uh, in one way, and there is a measure when, right in another way, so whenever you put something called black hole as an argument to your load test, then you can call this consume. So black hole basically consume and, and ensure, consumes and ensures that your result will be used, like JVM will not ignore it. So what you do, you look into JMH examples, it takes like, I don't know, 20 minutes to uh, more or less know which, which kind of pitfalls you have. Uh, and then you use it, I will, okay, I actually I've shown you some of JMH tests here. So, these were JMH tests done in Scala, but doesn't really uh, differ much from Java. So you see, I returned double so that it was consumed here, I returned unit. It's, unit is more or less the same as void in Java, so I didn't return the result of this. And that's how I had uh, that code eliminated. Yeah, and that's how I had more or less wrong uh, results of benchmarks. But that was on purpose. So basically, one rule, you sh if your test runs for three seconds or two seconds and you measure this current time millis and then you print 100 millisecond, this does nothing. Mostly, you should, uh, you should have some kind of a looping uh, uh, so that your code runs for minutes so that the results are stable. 
If you do a presentation and you have three IntelliJs open and then you start JMH benchmark, you will get sometimes really crazy results, yeah, because some something is in the background behind. You have you need to have some kind of a de dedicated hardware for that. Yeah. And results, and you check it multiple times so that those are uh, really results are meaningful. So I will show you that in a minute. So additionally, JMH support these things. Okay, uh, there is a small mistake, but you see, there is a prof. Uh, parameter which lets you dump performance counters, so statistics from from CPU or uh, or assembly code that was processed. That's how you can look at it. Uh, and mo the most important thing: sometimes you you just measure stuff and you see, okay, it's faster than I go with this version. And but the real, I would say, when you want to present benchmark, when you want to do science, let's say. When you want to like be responsible, you should typically look deeper. It is faster. I have benchmark for that, and I understand why it's faster. This is like because otherwise, maybe you just made a small mistakes, and I will not even count how many times I made a small mistake, even in a load test code, or I assumed something that was true only on one machine, etc., etc. Cetera, et cetera. It's very common. Everyone does these mistakes, but if you can find out. Ah, I know, because this is this error in JDK 8 something, and I accidentally just uh, seeing this error in this code. Then maybe you have explanation, and now, now you, you can have something like a solution for a problem. Yeah. So sometimes we have to go deeper, and that's where I basically, uh, we have half of our exactly great, how we go to assembly. So I will show you something like Hufi, those are two, uh, Two codes in Scala, uh, so now everyone should get out. So who is coding in Scala? Okay, some of you. Scala is a language that is simpler in Java, basically. That's the most important, and there is a proof for that. Basically, if you look at the grammatic of Scala, so BNF or ANT or whatever, it's shorter than Java, it's simpler. So, yeah, just shorter than, it's simpler than Java 8 at least, and even better for uh, newer Java versions. But we have a, Scala is a language that supports uh, functional programming, it means supports immutability. So we have this class, it's a record, case class is a record. In, in Kotlin that would be a data class, that has one field total, which is integer and by default initially it's zero if you don't provide it. And it has one method add, which returns a new calculator, which basically you add, you add i. That's just some kind of, it actually should be called accumulator, this calculator, but you know, naming is hard. Then I have additional method which allows me to look inside and get this. Why not? Then I have mutating calculator, which is still possible in Scala, that I have variable, oh, I, whenever I see this keyword, I, I hate this code in, instantly. So I have variable zero, and now I change the object. So it's basically mutating. I change this total with add, so I don't create new objects, I'm doing a side effect, etc. Who thinks the, who will, which code will be generally faster? What? Immutable will be fast, immutable will be faster. Why? Second one, okay. Who is for the second one that will be faster? Who is for the first that will be faster? Okay, some of you. Okay, the answer is, <laughs> it depends. <laughs> but okay. Uh, so, I haven't, that, that I was unfair. I should have actually showed you this code. So, how we do with that. So, in, in imperative, we do a for each, and, and in, a, in, a, in, a, in a functional immutable, we do this folding. So, but if you know more or less how this works, you should now see, oh, this second one is even slower. Because it's some, it's like streams, yeah. But those are the results. And it takes some time to get these results, so, okay, we can try it. So they are more or less the same. Uh, but there is a trick about it. It's, they are the same on GraalVM, this version, and basically any GraalVM. You don't have to use, uh, you can use community edition, don't, don't have to use enterprise edition, 
but they are as fast. If you run it on a hotspot classical, let's say normal Java that most of us use, you will see that actually immutable yeah, is not that great. And that's not, an, uh, uh, that's not a side effect. It's not an accident. Uh, exactly GraalVM, one of the reasons it was created is Graal, it's, uh, that it should handle functional immutable code better. Almost like the uh, like imperative code, and it seems that sometimes it does. But how can we know that? So who knows that? Yeah. So this dumps a bytecode of uh, of the class. So okay, maybe I have somewhere this code. So I was running that before. Uh, I won't now waste time on running this. If you. If you don't trust me, we can try it later. So where do I have this code of, uh, of calculator here? So calculator run, and let me get into, okay, I will kill the visual VM. Uh -huh. And now the target. So I need to find out where there are the classes. Uh, I forgot. So the classes uh, that I'm interested in. So it's immutable calculator. Mm. Maybe. Okay. This is in package uh, calculator immutable. So I have to. Uh, classes calculator immutable. Okay, now I have some classes, and I can do basically this. Uh, as you see, one Scala class is multiple classes in Java. Maybe uh, this will actually doesn't show anything sensible. Uh, yeah, this shows just empty class, but we can do better if I use uh, uh, which actually uh, maybe one more or less. Sorry, it's. I wanted to make fonts bigger, but it doesn't help me really. So I will look at particularly this class. As you see, it's those that have a calculator class. Okay. And this is uh, this is our great bytecode. And the thing is, you don't really have to know the bytecode uh, that much. Normally. The moments I had to investigate, the times I had to investigate bytecode in order to solve production uh, um, problem, nearly one, a little bit less than that. Okay, I tried actually more times, but never analyzing bytecode really helped me in a practical, real practical problem. I was mostly only this analyze, analyzing of bytecode typically only helps me to confirm that something I found is actually true, because I see difference in, in bytecode, etc. But it's not uh, analyzing bytecode and reading a bytecode is not something that we really need to master in order to see the problem. I'm now looking for a calculator immutable, which method I'm looking for. So you see normally methods, apply, unapply. Oh, that's actually not the code I wanted to look. Ah, that was a different. A uh, small mistake. Uh, calculator, this class. Actually, I was sure. Oh. That's it. this method equals. Ah, this is the case class method and should have add somewhere on top. So here is the code of adding. And what we see here, it's actually uh, doing some, calling a copy method. So. There is absolutely no trick here. This is a full, let's say, the slow version. There is absolutely no magic here. So it calls copy, add something. So you have comments here. And the copy method somewhere below, maybe I'll, okay, maybe I'll show it. The copy method below, uh, okay, I'm at the end. I somehow missed it. Should be somewhere here, copy, uh, hash code. No, oh, it's close here. Product element. So you see tons of, oh, here is copy. 
And what the copy does is actually creates new object. This is important. So there is always a new object here created. So it should produce immutable version tons of garbage. But somehow we don't see a difference in the performance. <coughs> because in order to solve this magic why immutable code is <coughs> actually fast, we need to go deeper. We need to go to the assembly. And this is this trick. Have you ever tried? Who tried this? So JVMs basically support, sorry, I have to drink a little bit, support this uh, additional attribute print assembly. Normally, we will add it to the JDK. It will complain that you have to also enable some diagnostic options. So, But you know, I don't even put it here because it will exactly show you what you also have to add. What is here important is like if you are assembly fan like me, you need to add this additional option because otherwise it will produce some ugly syntax NTNT that everyone who writes assembly hates. But this, this syntax, who actually loves AT&T syntax? Okay, no one. And that proves my point. So you all love reading assembly and writing in an Intel syntax. So the point is also mostly it never will work because it will complain when you start that something like HSDSO, or there is a small uh, different, actually different name of that, must be, it's not there. So what you do, you have to find out the shared library, which basically has uh, symbols for assembly. And you know what? I will show you that I have it somewhere. Oh, okay, CD. Mm. Mm -hmm. this. Yeah, so there is this file, and you have to actually get it. Uh, in the past, I was basically downloading it from some, you know, extremely safe pages, but you, I don't really like to do that. So there is a way to avoid that. There is a GitHub project which basically exactly contains this, uh, uh, this code. So you, if you build it, you will get this hide this. Okay, and now I made a small mistake because I just closed my presentation. We'll have to go back to this place. Okay, it's not bad. So, so also, okay, maybe let me show that. So uh, now mm, I want to uh, run this code uh, with a uh, uh, with JMH, I want it, uh, I will run it with uh, Graal, print compilation. So we'll see that things that it compiles. Okay, we don't see actually print assembly, but it's not a problem. So I will run, add print assembly. Mm, I will actually, oh, so I will have, would have to add. So the whole process, uh, okay, you will see the ugly syntax because I don't remember how to put uh, Intel one. Apply, now it will ask me for some additional enable VM something, something. Uh, yeah, this one. Okay. Uh, slowly, but we're getting there. And now we'll see ugly syntax that I cannot read and my mind closes, but okay, doesn't matter. Oh, ooh, ooh. Why, why, why not? Uh, I didn't apply, okay. Uh, ah, yeah, you are sure. Yeah, that's actually, that was the problem. I didn't put, I put it after. And actually, it's funny because you can enable and disable and there's additional diagnostic options. Uh, there's some other uh, unlock something, uh, commercial options. Oh. And now we see assembly. It's so cool. Yeah, I see back right there. But you know what? We can look for the code we are interested for. So we can, like, this, is, this is a really stupid way of doing that. But how we can find, we can look for add. Mm, but not that add, but add this. Oh, moment. Uh, how it's actually calc run? I know. 
the easiest way to find the interesting piece of code. So you see actually a lot of comments. Those comments were generated by, uh, by this uh, uh, hotspot. So you actually see where does this co code comes from. It's uh, this assembly, no human would produce that. It's really ugly, mostly. But nevertheless, you can find stuff there. A moment, I will show you how I probably find the interesting line. Uh, that's what kind of method is that? It's, uh, it's not this, but just a moment. OK, I cannot promise that I will find. Uh, OK, I will look for a calculator. Calc. OK, back. Uh, oh, calc run uh, main apply. And I should look for some addition here. Mm, not this. Uh, not this. Okay. Oh, that looks like that looks like the code I know that is exactly doing this. So, okay, I can. It will take me only two days to analyze this code. Uh, but basically, you have unlooped here uh, uh, calculator add, and what you see here is that if you analyze it, it this code is extremely verbose. It's Potentially, machine knows that I have to actually do multiple ads, not one, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I cannot really understand why it does it, but it does it. And but what you won't see here is you wouldn't see here uh, allocations. This old code was act at the end transferred to the relatively simple as simple assembly that basically changes the the register and makes a loop. And there is absolutely no calls for additional objects, etc. So. Uh, uh, additional way how to print that is you run JMH with this run prof. Uh, okay, we have 20 minutes. I can run it. Why not? I can run it, and I will keep talking about something else. So that's okay. Ah, terminal. <laughs> okay. So will it be running, so if you do this perform, you will go. But there are better ways to look at it. Oh, so you can also run something called JITWatch. So now let me try JITWatch. The small problem with JITWatch is that, ah, did I kill it? Oh, no, actually, I haven't killed it, probably. So if I go to terminal, uh, let me go to some this terminal, CD programs. Uh, oh, I don't have JITWatch here. Okay, moment. Why not? CDDF presentation. Maybe I have JITWatch here. Oh. Oh, I did it. So G. Oh, I know what I cut. I know one thing. I forgot how to call JITWatch, but okay, maybe. Uh, maybe I don't remember. Maven uh, wrapper and then. Uh, Package should be enough. It's like Java. Uh, for some reason, I never created script for that. If it doesn't work, I will I will uh, refer to the documentation. But you know, only if it doesn't work, there is absolutely no one can should read documentation before getting into trouble. That's yeah, not how we do stuff. Okay. Okay. So uh, small thing. So if you put this uh, trace class loading or this log file here. And so this is basically for old JDKs. This is for newer ones. You will get some uh, additional file. Mm, OK, maybe. OK, um, okay. it doesn't matter what numbers we'll get. This is the file with a dump of all the classes as an assembly. And now you see the better syntax that I can actually read and all that stuff. And this dump can be read even by, OK, when it starts by JITWatch, oh, I didn't want to test. Skip test. I should have used. Okay, later. We'll wait. Uh, oh, I will show you some moment the JITWatch starts. But this is a cool tool that shows you like this is my code, this is my uh, bytecode, and and this is my assembly associated with this bytecode, and then it's a little bit easier to find stuff uh, visually. Uh, the problem. It actually, I would say, it works well up to 
Java 8, more or less, and 9. And then the newer the Java is, uh, the, uh, the more problems you have. So basically, it doesn't find the classes. OK, so we'll just see it. Uh, if I open this log file that was generated when I run this, I start scanning it. Uh, and, yeah, and I see calculator, immutable, and I go here. Like, OK, maybe this was better. Uh, actually, OK, I wanted a, a runner. Uh, maybe, actually, I wanted this one. So this is, in fact, the method that makes sense to look at. But unfortunately, on the Graal, it shows me that. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, I knew it doesn't really work well. Uh, but we'll see. So the, the, the actual case I wanted to show, I would not be able to demonstrate, because exactly the most important method that now was generated and compiled to assembly, uh, JITWatch cannot find it. Because new Java, some changes, it has problems with some lambdas, especially if it comes from a Scala. So not always it works, but you know, maybe one of you will fix this tool. It's actually still great, especially that tons of problems are still reported for Java 8, and it works really nice for Java 8. Uh, and so you see, for instance, this code with uh, level 2, C1. So it needs really not really optimal, and you more or less you can navigate. Uh, and again, it's not really that you have to look at this assembly, but if you want to know more, this is exactly the place you can go. Yeah, it's maybe you, so. We've just uh, okay generated. Oh, so. So if I run this, uh, so what I did run with uh, SMF, I did perf asm, and again I had some assembly. Yeah, so I have some assembly here, exactly the one. So this time I had assembly of my, let's say, of my inline of my compiled methods. So that's another way of look at it. How can you look at it? Uh, if I do it only like that, and let me do it very very quickly. Uh, that's really. I should be burning hell for that, but uh, I don't have much time. So this is exactly how to look at performance counters. So you remember this exercise with false sharing. So this is the easy way to uh, demonstrate, uh, to look at performance counters. OK, we'll wait only 30 seconds so we can do that. So JMS really has support for that, it's uh, JMH. And by the way, it has support for many more options, but I don't really know all of them. So I only know those because that's what I was interested into. Mm. Okay, let's let's wait this few more seconds. Okay, so this time, okay, so that's what you get at the end exactly. Uh, Decache load misses. So you see, for instance, what was that method? That was imperative version, not that many cache misses. So actually quite cool. You see, it, it looks like an awesome code. Uh, so let's see immutable version. Not that bad either. So actually, so and uh, funny thing about it, uh, you never actually had to go into, uh, into JITWatch to assembly to find out why this immutable calculator is so good. Because the answer was, if I used tools correctly, OK, originally, let's say, when I was analyzing that, I, wasn't, I was using tools correctly because, I don't know, I had a better day. That was the result I got. This is, what is this? This is, uh, this is from Flight Recorder, and this is uh, memory usage. This is version on Java 8. This is version on Graal. So what we see? Completely flat diagram. It means that on Graal, we don't have any allocation. So we, theoretically, we have this line, create new calculator uh, with a different value inside. But Graal is smart enough to understand, oh, you are uh, working with immutable objects. I recognize this pattern. Let me actually do the calculations on just some register. And so that you can spare you uh, objects. And what is winning here is known as escape analysis. So, so the compiler looks at your code and knows, oh, those objects never actually uh, escape your code. So maybe I don't have to create them on, uh, on a heap. I can create them on stack, or even I can decompose them into just registers. Uh, yeah, and this is a great thing that uh, Graal does for you. 
Uh, unfortunately, it's not that I have Scala code. It means I run it on Graal, and it's always great. Some code is faster, some code is slower. At this moment, okay, I can. Uh, if you have particular small piece of code, you can you can decide what is better for you. But on the long run, I actually I'm, I don't think I will anywhere using Graal on production. We just use classical JVMs, let's say, and yeah, because the, the gain is not as big. So now I'm finishing. So are there questions? Because I'm going to sum it up. So are there any questions? We have last 10 minutes. OK, no questions. You are all sleeping. Sorry? Almost, OK. OK, it's so fascinating assembly code. Who was, who was coding assembly last five years? Oh, some of you, great. Was it fun? Uh, well, so one yes or not. So uh, you did it for fun or you just need it? For fun. So I coded assembly for fun and it was fun. Who had to do assembly for real, let's say, production thing? Oh, great. Ah, okay, long, long time ago, okay. But yeah, mostly it makes no sense at all. So I'm, a few times I was doing assembly just to check how good C compilers are. Right? And those are. If you write assembly and you think you are smart, typically C compiler nowadays GCC open, so it showed you that it's, mo it's way, way smarter. Even if you think, oh, I know this AVX registers and I will do crazy stuff with them, then simple C with some optimizations is just better. And then, but then you can learn what kind of optimization it used, and you can you make your code after a lot of effort better. But it takes a lot of time, so it makes no sense mostly. That's why we don't uh, use assembly. So some at the end. Uh, things to remember from this talk. I basically, I wanted to show you tools. i shown some crazy behavior or some uh, JDK stuff, but that was there, that was uh, visible on this machine mostly. Uh, actually, I think all the demos worked for some reason, I don't know why. They never worked before this presentation, but yeah. Uh, so you have to remember that only a little bit of your code is hot. So maybe if you, okay, if your whole application is basically a batch, you start and goes to end, so then maybe it's hot full time, but most of our applications have only some pieces that are uh, oh, even if it's batch, typically there is some kind of a loop that is performed the most. But so, might be that it's more than 5%, might be that it's 10% or something. But it's really small amount of code that is responsible for how your application is perceived, how actually it behaves. Yeah, in terms of latency, in terms of uh, through output. Now the tools. So. A lot will be given to you by uh, JVM arguments. So verbose GC, you see, for instance, if I run this calculator run again with, with verbose GC, I would see that there happens no garbage collection. I know already where the potentially why it's so fast. Then print compilation. So if you see some strange behavior, something is incredibly slow, maybe it's good to turn print compilation. And sometimes it will exactly print you not only that your method wasn't uh, that your method wasn't compiled, it will show you why. And especially you, if you see something called uncommon trap or trap and the the, the the compiled, you know that something might be wrong there, and it's good to investigate. Uh, so typically, uh, when it happens, when your method throws a lot of exceptions, especially when it was never throwing exceptions. And then, for after a while, it just throws exception. This is a horrible thing for uh, for JIT for for compiled code. Basically, the compiled your code, the compiles your code and reverts to in, uh, interpret it. Which, if you have uh, exception driven code, which I've seen a lot of times, it might really perform badly. And few, in, I had actually few productive cases with exception-driven development, so basically that the flow of control was uh, driven by exceptions, throwing exceptions here, catching there, and that led to incredibly slow performance of production. There are more reasons behind it, for instance, on one moment, uh, um, IBM virtual machine was extremely slow on that, so for instance, all Sun at that time was quite okay with throwing like 1,000 exceptions per second, but IBM not, so there was this 
also problems, but basically throwing stones of exceptions and using exceptions means you are unfriendly from compilation, and especially you are unfriendly for inlining. Okay, print assembly, uh, uh, basically, it's only if you are interested. It's not something that will help you in a practical case, but it's funny to watch. Uh, command line tools, JSTAT, JSTAC, JPS, Java P, uh, all of them can help you, especially first two ones, actually first three ones, like uh, diagnose what's going on in the machine. You just logged into some server, something going on. Exactly, for instance, this application is now slow. Someone pressed the button, it's now slow. Then run a JSTAC and you see where the threads are. Cool. And then you have GUI tools, JConsole and JVisualVM. So basically, VisualVM is a poor man profiler. Uh, you don't have to, um, you, uh, it's, it's basically for free, you just use it. And it has sampler and profiling. And it's good enough to try uh, if, as long as you can basically run your code not on production but on your own machine, which should be normally the case, then you can use Visual VM to investigate problems. Uh, benchmarking, remember that it is tough and basically JMH, but you, you need to get some real numbers that are, you can repeat, that you can present before it was that, now after it is this. You need a number. Because quite often, and I stress that, especially with uh, garbage collection tuning. This is, uh, but I would say JMH uh, doesn't help with garbage collection tuning that much, but you can also use it a little bit. But I would say for garbage collection tuning, it's better exactly to use Gatling than have some scenario, user logs in, user does that, then we do it 100 times, and then we see the performance of application under different garbage collection uh, parameters. And do not trust all those benchmarks, as you see, because those, are, those numbers are faked. But no, actually, even if they are not faked, it's easy to produce. I can tell it as a developer, and learned it in my first job as a professional developer, how to produce any number you want to present. It's basically, it's actually, it's hard to not, uh, to not mistake in benchmarks, and it's hard to produce actually honest benchmark. Typically, if you compare two solutions, this is one framework A, framework B. So my framework A is one, the one I love, so I learned a lot how to optimize that. Framework B I hate, so I put any code there, and it works as any. So typically not great. And even if you try to be honest, it's it somehow always gets like this. So it's very hard to uh, make a good benchmark. So whenever I see benchmark, I see, does it have a source code? Mm, does it tell which machine it was run on, that uh, hardware? Can I repeat it? Now, maybe I don't have the same machine, but I can, I can compare it to my. Then can I look at the code, what common mistakes are that? And by the way, I published a couple of benchmarks on a GitHub. And people were actually putting issues. This is wrong. You didn't know about it. Something was wrong. That's actually a great way. And even after some you know, cycles, people putting issues in this, there were sometimes number changed. I still cannot say this is a fully honest benchmark. No, this is benchmark as good as I, at this moment, I can tell you. And maybe some of you will look at this benchmark and find some other problem. Maybe uh, it's actually not really honest. Yeah? It is. That's life. It's like uh, it's uh, it's engineering, not uh, sometimes real science. Yeah, it's science when we present numbers, but uh, engineering is saying this is the, my best effort. But maybe it could be something better that I don't know. Uh, by the way, uh, oh, I think I missed one slide. Uh, so oh, th this one. Never ever <laughs> actually I solved uh, uh, error watching assembly on production. Really never. It's just. No, it's not like that. Even more, I remember when I was uh, when I was con I was C plus plus developer and I started with Java. There was one thing that was promised. Oh, when Java is too slow for you, you can always put a native method in C plus plus. And then I tried it, and I learned how slow JNI is. So even if I could, and there were moments if I could produce better code than JVM uh, using C plus plus or using C with GNI, I couldn't really put it to use because the cost of calling this code was too high. Basically, you need like uh, matrices of, I don't know, thousand by thousand really large objects that you can process in the C, uh, maybe in machine learning, that's the way, for instance, Python is doing, and some libraries actually in Java are doing that this way. Uh, 
to put it on GPU to actually gain some um, something. But if your code is like, you know, I just uh, multiply a couple of vectors, no, not at this moment. Uh, however, they work on the better uh, uh, foreign function interface, basically, in Java. I have, uh, I have not yet experimented with that, but might be that will be much better. Uh, OK. That's also a message. I, actually, this is the third time it appears, or fourth. The modern computer, if we can, if we look how it executes, we can think it's like serial. It just does instruction one by one. But when we look from a performance perspective, no, it's not that simple. And yeah, and also one thing: common code, simple code, code that people write, clean code, but sometimes not really that clean. The code that is most common will become faster because the CPU vendors would try to show you, oh, use my CPU because this thing made by normal people works faster on that. The same with JVM vendors. Yeah? And yeah. are there more questions? Because we are at the end. No questions. OK, so thank you, and have a fun with assembly uh, at uh, DevOps. <laughs>